Well, first of all, thank you for uh, coming all this way. And uh, yeah, it's. I think this is the most crowded rescue tea ever since until now. Um, I know that we are a bit late, so I will be very quick with the first presentation. And then we will continue with uh, our program. If you don't have uh, these, just let me know during the break so that I can share along with you. First questions first. Can everybody hear me all right, especially the ones in the back? Uh, second question, can everybody hear me all right online? Okay, okay. So they can also hear uh, us, perfect. So let me, let me begin. Very quickly, uh, I will be uh, brief. So I will just first welcome you to ETAS, talk a little bit about ETAS. Uh, then I will talk about the project we are running at ETAS and the more general quantum technologies uh, efforts. Uh, I will go over the program very quickly uh, and you know, just talk about some last minute uh, changes. And then there will be some housekeeping rules uh, about the Institute. So, oh. and if you have any questions during this entire event, either through our online audience or on-site audience, here is my email. Just feel free to send me an email. Um, okay, some figures with ETAS. Uh, we have been, I mean, ETAS have been around uh, for more than 20 years. Right now, it has over 130 employees, uh, many ongoing projects. So it's like a, it's like a big institute. Uh, and quantum is just a small part of it. Uh, in general, the tasks and goals, I mean, you can, of course, find these in our uh, brochures and, you know, uh, uh, pamphlets as well. But... Uh, primarily, we do research into the consequences of new uh, scientific and technological developments and their science-based evaluation. Uh, as the name suggests, we are an institute for technology assessment and systems analysis, so we cover uh, wide uh, and broad uh, topics and uh, methods. In uh, terms of what we kind of do uh, for research profile, you know, problem-oriented research, value-based research, scientific independence, and claim to excellence. Uh, I'm going a bit fast because we are behind, uh, but uh, I, if you're interested in the ETAS profile, I strongly recommend you to check our website. It's very uh, nice, and uh, you can find all the information you want there. Um, main topics at ETAS, you know, uh, data, information, knowledge, which is, like, very expected, sustainability, transformation of the energy systems, which is a big thing at ETAS as well, and KIT, because it's important for KIT. Uh, mobility, we have a very good mobility group uh, working on uh, especially the Kasra and the surrounding region. Uh, participation and governance, uh, life and technology, which is our group, light group, uh, and regions and ethics. Um, we uh, aim for many different addresses in terms of our knowledge for action uh, approach like the German Bundestag, the Office of Technology Assessment, uh, European Parliament uh, through uh, STOA, which is, I think now it's called Panel for Future and Emerging uh, Technologies. Um, the, the federal ministries, the commission, uh, states, companies, associations, all the, all the good ones. Um, we have local, national, and international uh, networking and cooperation. Uh, I, for example, I see uh, a lot of uh, colleagues from TU Delft here, uh, which uh, KIT and TU Delft have also uh, been in a long relationship for uh, quite some years. Uh, TAP, as I mentioned, it is an independent scientific institution, but it has been uh, operated by ETAS with others uh, since 1990, uh, and it supports opinion forming and decision making for the German Bundestag. Uh, certain tasks of TAB, uh, like uh, the technology radar, uh, pointing out consequences, providing orientation, communicating science, networking, uh, you know, the regular uh, technology assessment uh, services. Uh, a brief history of ETAS. ETAS has been uh, formally around uh, for almost 30 years, uh, but, uh, you know, KIT was formed later. Uh, so uh, technically, we have been part of KIT since 
I think for the last 12 years. Uh, there are many different research groups, uh, like uh, you can, again, as I said, you can check on the webpage. Uh, the quantum technologies efforts are covered under life, innovation, health, and technology. So the light group, uh, which is led by Christopher Kern. Uh, we also have uh, Tatup uh, located at uh, ETAS. It is a, a journal dedicated to TA. Uh, and if you are interested in learning more about it or running a special uh, topic issue, uh, just, uh, you know, check the web page or connect via uh, this QR code. Uh, and also we are hosting part of Global TA, uh, which is a global network on technology assessment uh, associations and organizations. Uh, again, if, okay, so this is unfortunate. <laughs> You can read it, but you know, just let me know, and I can share. I can share the web page with you. Um, so the project we are running is called QTech. You know, Quantum Technology Innovations for Society. It is kind of intentionally vaguely named because you know we want to be able to do uh, kind of all of the all of the below. Uh, so the the main topics uh, we are interested in: landscaping of the QT ecosystems, education and outreach research in QT and concept exploration and operationalization for ELSA research on QT. It's a mouthful, but it's like, we, we try to explore concepts. Uh, that's, that's the main idea. And uh, I am the project coordinator, Adrian, who is not here right now, but he's in the Institute building. He is the, uh, the, the other PhD and also Ulrike is here and she's, the, uh, she's also working with us. Uh, I will go over this because we don't have time, but you know, feel free to check. Uh, we also do outreach activities. Uh, so this was something we did with the uh, Stadt uh two years ago. Uh, we also organized this quantum games exhibition, uh, which was very nice. And uh, we are running a special collection at the, at the journal Nanoethics. Just feel free to reach to me if you're interested in it. Uh, this is the fourth iteration of Responsible Quantum Technologies. Uh, and uh, as you can see, we uh, use the regular IBM picture as always. And uh, so thank, thank you, IBM. Then <laughs> uh, thanks. And uh, I, I, I edit this after our uh, conversation with Doug yesterday because he asked me, okay, what, do you, what is responsible? you know, technology for you. And this is from our uh, PhD module. So this is what basically every PhD uh, student at ETAS learns, uh, kind of a, a very simplistic way as a start to frame what responsible technology is. And it is basically putting uh, in ourselves at a, at, a, at a point where it is not entirely focused on benefits, not entirely focused on harms, but trying to walk the reach walk and uh, I, you know, just acknowledge that, okay, there are some potential advantages, there are some potential risks, uh, how, to, how to find a way to mitigate the risks, how to find the share, uh, uh, the potential benefits with uh, all the stakeholders or, you know, as equitably as possible. Uh, the program, so right now, I think I'm fast enough. We are only five minutes late. Uh, and we will start with uh, responsible QT efforts. All of our speakers are here, which is a very good thing uh, because I didn't uh, have that much faith in Deutsche Bahn, uh, but uh, yeah. And uh, you know, you all have your programs. Uh, one last minute change is in the second day uh, for the uh, session role of QT in the Converging Technologies debate. Uh, some speakers had to drop out. Uh, so we will only have one speaker uh, for, the, for that session, uh, but we will have an extended uh, debate uh, on the topic moderated by the wonderful uh, Benzel here. Uh, and uh, yeah, for uh, tomorrow evening, we will have a conference dinner uh, at, uh, at the place that we also had the dinner uh, last year. Uh, but for those of you who, are, who were not here last year, it's just a street away. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, regarding finding this restaurant, just let me know tomorrow. Uh, and yeah, for, for the third day, uh, we will end up around uh, five.
Correct. Some housekeeping rules. So uh, there are people working on this floor, as some of you have seen. So if you want to explore, please do so quietly. Uh, the entrance door, again, as you have seen, uh, requires uh, access cards. So please inform us if you need to leave the building for a, for a reason. Um, you know, the presentations are being recorded and will be made public afterwards. If you don't want uh, them to be uh, public, let me know so that we can just delete them from the recordings or we can stop the recording while we are making your presentation. Uh, and for the online participants, you know, please mute yourself when you're not asking questions. And uh, we will try to arrange some Zoom breakout rooms during the breaks. Uh, so if you're interested in that, just let us know. And that being said, I'd like to thank you for your attention and welcome to Rescue Team. All right, perfect, thank you. So good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for the introduction. So indeed, I'm going to talk about the ethics course that I have developed within the new master program that we have at the TU Delft and which is focused on quantum information science and technology, so QUIST, which is the acronym that I'm going to use a lot in this presentation. So I will in particular uh, highlight the challenges, successes of pitfalls of doing such a course. And so the plan of the presentation is, is pretty straightforward. So first I will introduce you the context, so the program itself, how it was set up. Then I will narrow down on the course uh, of ethics, so I will explain the learning objectives and how the course is operated. And then I will tell you about the main activity of the course and the, basically the feedback that I got on it, which are so-called ethical role play deliberations. More on that. And here you can see on the right a picture with a few of the students, students of the master program. So let's get started. And first I want to emphasize that this master program is not TU Delft, it is actually delocalized over two cities, Delft and Leida, and the students do commute between the two cities for their courses. So it's really something where two universities merge and you could argue even a third one. Um, also the specificity of this master program is that it's multidisciplinary. So the students that are accepted have a bachelor degree either in physics or in math or in electrical engineering or in computer science. So the consequence of that um, is the structure of the master program. So at the very beginning, the very first step of the master program is this so-called homologation phase. So you see that in the first quarter of the year, so the first half of the first semester, students take courses so they get all on the same level with respect to quantum physics, mathematics, electrical engineering, and so on. And they also have a first flavor of working in a team as they have to work on a case that we give them in a team project. Then in a second step, the student take the, so the core courses of the program. So they don't pick them. It's basically the very basics of everything you need to know about quantum technologies to be a professional in that field. And then afterwards, in the second semester, they move on to elective courses so that they have selected according to their tastes. So that means that the end of Q2 is a bit of a strategic moment since they need to select their elective courses, which in my view should then be also aligned with their professional ambition. And so that's why the course that I have developed, Equip, is located over here. So it addresses career orientation and ethics, and this is why it comes at that specific moment. And then in the second year, uh, there is another team project, this time on company cases. And afterwards, they very classically do their master thesis project. So the size of the group that we have is rather small because this is the first time that we're running this master program. So this year, we had 70 students, 17. And we expect to have something like 50, 60 students next year. So this has consequences for the organization. So that's for the master program itself. Let me now move on on the ethics education of this. So ethics is addressed in the team projects because this is where they actually implement ethical reflection on a real case, but it's also addressed in the course I developed, so equip, equipping the quiz professional, which comes in the first year. 
And so I promised you some challenges. So here is challenge number one. How do you keep students engaged in a standalone course, which is basically all about ethics? Because you can imagine that students in basic sciences are not necessarily very interested in reading about Kant or Aristotle or such things. So you need to somehow get them interested. Now, about the conditions of the course. Um, so I don't teach it alone. I am actually I have a co-lecturer, uh, Peter Deckers, who is actually more specialized in teaching secondary um, uh, educate, secondary teachers. So in that sense, he has experience in making students reflect uh, on their practice and learn together. The course weighs one uh, European credit, which means that we have only 28 hours in total, in person and at home, to cover uh, the learning objectives of the course. So that's challenge number two. How do you get everything done within such little time? And given the fact that students have already a pretty heavy workload with their uh, hard science courses. So part of the answer is uh, you assess them on a pass-fail basis and give them rather small assignments such that they don't need to spend all of their time at home on the assignments. And finally, the contents of the course, which I guess is the most interesting. The approach we have taken is actually to divide the course in two halves. The first half comes in the second quarter and we address career orientation. So the idea is that the students really project themselves in their professional future, explore different career paths such that they have a better idea of what the ecosystem is composed of. And then in the third quarter, we move on to ethical reflection, where actually we consider this time more, uh, well, ethics problem, case studies, ethical dilemmas, and the idea is that there is a synergy between the two topics, like career orientation is a pretext to explore ethics, and ethics is a pretext to project yourself in your professional future. So it's a bit of a, of a opportunistic approach to me, because I assume that master students are anxious about their future, and I want this anxiety to be recycled uh, into optimism and enthusiasm for ethics. And I think it works rather okay. So moving on, I'd like to now prevent, present the learning objectives of the course. So there are mostly two learning objectives, one on career orientation, the other ethics. So the first one is that the student should be able to formulate a viable professional uh, strategy that is in line with their professional identity. And the second one is about being able to express your own view on ethical, social, and scientific integrity issues on techno-scientific questions related to quantum technologies. So my approach to this is to say that in order to achieve this second learning objective, there are two pillars. On the one hand, the student need to develop the ability of ethical analysis, of ethical reflection. So basically having different, different frameworks and crossing these perspectives. And on the other hand, in order to implement a moral decision that they would have come up with, they also need to understand the ecosystem that they are going to work inside. So in that sense, you need to rely on ethical frameworks and sociology of organizations, which gives you some tools for these two pillars and hopefully can help you uh, in your ethical reflection. So how do I do that in practice? Well, I have defined some, let's say, intermediate learning goals, which uh, I write here. I realize that this slide is pretty text heavy, but at the end of the day, in order to achieve these goals, um, the key activity of the course are these so-called ethical role-played deliberations, which I am now going to explain a little bit. So, the structure of the course you see is really focused around these deliberations. So the course runs over a quarter and you see that the main activities are located over here. We do two rounds of deliberation in week five and in week seven. They both come with a certain time of preparation. And so in order to prepare this, a couple of lectures are given in the first few weeks 
uh, of the quarter. And so it, it's a mixture of, of lecturing and activities because activities are usually a lot more engaging and they enlighten the students way more than a lecture in hindsight. Now about the role play deliberations themselves, uh, here is a schematic of the setup. So the idea is that since I have a group of 20 students, I divide the group uh, in two subgroups of 10. And you can see that the, the first group of 10 has their deliberation. So it's role played, which means that they don't defend their own opinion. They play a role of a given stakeholder <clears throat> that they have to choose uh, early on in the course. And so they are assembled by rule. So number one, number two, number three. And while the first group deliberates, the second group observes the deliberation and is tasked to try to observe which narrative is put forward, which stakeholder is dominating the conversation, who's talking and who is not talking, and have some kind of critical um, uh, feedback to give to the other subgroup to that take part to the deliberation. Now, about the topics that were addressed, so this year, 2024, we do two rounds of deliberations, so four topics. The first one was about knowledge safety. So that is a topic that is actually quite hot in the Netherlands, because by next year, we need to have some sort of a policy to apply nationwide. And so the TU has started uh, a cycle of, of reflection about knowledge safety, and I wanted to essentially copy this with my group of students. And so the question they had to deliberate on was, what should be the knowledge safety policy at the TU Delft? And since we had a group of students, both Dutch and foreigner, it was a pretty engaged conversation, I would say. The second deliberation was about the scientific fraud accusations that we have had at the TU Delft, that maybe you've heard about, and that I thought that we couldn't really avoid it since we are the TU Delft. So uh, it was actually a very interesting conversation to have. And it was really a more traditional sort of deliberation about scientific misconduct and how to prevent it. But this time in a context of quantum research where, you know, hype and the diversity of funding comes into the picture. The third topic was actually inspired by a talk given here uh, last year by ISF, and it's about how we talk about quantum technologies in the media. And the question that the students had to deliberate about what, was what should be a good code of conduct for people who engage in communication on quantum technology. And finally, the final deliberation was about uh, climate action. And so the question I came up with was uh, completely fictitious. So I asked them, let's imagine a world where the European Research Council opens a new funding line about quantum computing for climate action. And I give some, some numbers for the students. Should this happen? Should it not? Should we modify the conditions? And in what way? And it was actually a, a very entertaining conversation, I would say. <laughs> so this actually brings me now to my conclusion. So I had promised you challenges, successes, and pitfalls. So here they come. So about student engagement, uh, relating ethics to career orientation and choosing uh, topics which are really local about related to the TU Delft shows to the students that actually ethics is everywhere around them already and that they can engage in these topics already during their studies and that this is something that they keep, they need to keep practicing their entire life. It's not a box that you can check just like this with a course. Um, with the challenge of workload and time management, at the end, I would argue, lecture as little as you can, even less than I did, and focus on well-designed activities which can achieve the learning goals that you have come up with. In terms of successes, I would say that the role-play deliberations worked more than I had anticipated. And it's a good example where the students can implement both halves of the course, the ethical reflection, as well as the analysis of the ecosystem, the sociology part. And finally, in terms of pitfalls, 
Oh yeah, I would argue your deliberations require well and clear questions where an action needs to be taken at the end of the deliberation. If it's vague, it goes nowhere. At least that's the experience I have with this. And finally, the pitfalls, I would argue, don't spend too much, part, too much time on ethical frameworks. Uh, Kant, Aristotle, and other philosophers are very interesting, but the students already have sort of an intuition of these ideas, and they don't see how this applies to quantum technologies. So to be honest with you, next year, we won't talk about these people. <laughs> and the second pitfall I would argue is that actually, from the feedback I got from the students, the deliberations were really an aha moment. And so I would argue have them as early as possible, even if the students don't really understand what it is about at the beginning, because this first experience will motivate everything for the rest of the course. At least this is what I will use next year uh, for the next iteration of this course. And with this being said, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Ah, did you just reopen you the mic? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you out the meeting. So ah, okay, so Ziggy is doing it because I'm coming to the microphone. Uh, it is also, anyway, it's more a comment than a question. Um, I think it's really, really insightful. Um, and I wanted to kind of reflect on your last pitfall on the ethical frameworks. Um, I think that that is really interesting. So you notice that in giving my talk, I, I said to the philosopher, this is, you know, not consequential, this is deontology and so on. But I never, also in my practice, I never ever use that because I noticed also that it's kind of to the, those who are philosophically, philosophically interested, they might care a little bit. But actually that we philosophers tend to like overthink, I think, how important these people and the frameworks are and that people, I think that you can kind of, what I'm wanting to stress is kind of you can um, sort of, not subconsciously, but you can bring those in and you can maybe see a difference be between deontological and consequentialist and so on, like those approaches, but it doesn't need the title. And I think that's a learning by the versa for how we teach quantum as well. So we, you know, maybe it teaches us to not start with the complicated, this is superposition, but rather explain what it is and then maybe give them what it is. Or like, I think people are interested then to say, oh, now I know what superposition is. And so I think that learning, it was, that was kind of a common, you can imagine to question, but like on, mm -hmm. could we, that learning, could we use that also for how we teach quantum? And I'm seeing people are very involved in quantum teaching quantum research, I'm seeing knots, but that was kind of what I, yeah, was curious about whether you think that might work the other way around. Uh, if I may, if I may rephrase, uh, like, uh, did, did physics part of the, the course that you offer learned from your strategy to teach, like, to uh, maybe, put a little bit behind the, the theory, the hardcore theory, and give up from uh, the, the juice, let's say, the, what the uh, use maybe. Um, so. Well, it so happens that I'm also a physics teacher. Clear, I am mostly a physics teacher. I, I teach the quantum mechanics course for the second year bachelor students. And I couldn't agree more with you, Mira. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I teach the quantum mechanics course, like quantum 101, and the course that is just before, introduction to waves. And so I introduce superposition in the waves course, because it's a lot more intuitive to understand superposition when you're like, you have this state of light, we have the polarization that is, I don't know, linear, and you can say, look, linear is the superposition of circular left and circular right. And this is light. This is like, this is not very quantum, is it? <laughs> And then three weeks later, I do the exact same talk. And this time, like, we're dealing now with a quantum state of a particle. And I am, I completely agree. This is the philosophy you, using the complicated words, the jargon can be intimidating or can, you know, it can be empowering to make these words your own. But to achieve that, you first need to understand the concepts without the big words, I would argue. Thank you very much. We have another question here, but how do we, how do we get them? Could you please conclude? Uh, I, don't, I think we need to be a bit fast, but I can move this for the question. I think we have to come and move. No, no, the, the, I, I realize that lunch will be here even if we are ready or not by 1.30. <laughs> so please.
Okay, yeah. So yes, one question on the deliberation process behind this ethics course. I mean, there's a mandatory ethics course is something rather new, I think. I haven't heard of many. Um, what can, or do you know what convinced the university officials or the program coordinators to integrate such an uh well mandatory course into the into the curriculum? And are there any tips you can give us, like argumentation hints that we can also use in our daily practice? So I don't know the full answer to your question because I wasn't involved in the full development of the master program. I joined the train as it was already on its tracks, but I think it's just legal obligation. Like we have to teach ethics by law or I think, or by regulation. At least I can tell you that all the bachelor students and all the master students of the university take an ethics course one way or another at one point or another. There is no escaping it. So the reply is we have to go to another lounge and <laughs> have a You would have to get an ethics course. <laughs> Maybe Peter has to take the share. To, to add on this, it, it, it doesn't help. Like when you make it compulsory, uh, students feel that as an obligation. So you need to amp up your enthusiasm to get them engaged, I would say. With the last question, we... Yeah, we yeah, yeah, right. You need to shout. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question is actually because I came from a country or university where physical students were not required to take ethics. So um, is there, a, do you plan to put out your materials, especially the deliberations and um, some more general resources and ethical frameworks or write up what you've done with the course? Maybe I'll plug in a quantum education conference, which is in September. <laughs> but um, where, where can they learn more about this and say whether well, universities want to point students towards resources but don't have time in the curriculum because it's not mandated and so they don't teach it? So to answer your question, I am definitely willing to share whatever I have developed with anyone who is interested. And if you're interested in other such teaching materials, I would recommend you that you join the Quantum Ethics Project and get in touch with, with Josie over here, because he's also very involved in quantum education. I mean, ethics education, I should say. And uh, yeah, and the more the merrier. Cool. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, thanks for the question. Let's send the speaker again. I'd like to invite Francisca. Francisca, you will forgive me that I always use your la your, your other last name, but uh, Grinja. Try not, try not to see. I don't even know how to read it well because I already left when we got married. So uh, Francisca, she's from the University of Braunschweig in Germany, and she will tell us about the the tremendous work she did to construct the quantum technology competence framework which we like to call the common language as this is our dream actually. And so we verbalize it so it will realize itself. And Francisca, I'm super happy because uh, it was me who teach Francisca quantum physics. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is amazing that she stayed with us. So she didn't run away as we sometimes think this would happen. And then she is doing her PhD and uh, she's working on cool Delphi studies and she will tell us about the results. Therefore. Yeah, thank you, Oksana. Yeah, I want to show you the new version of the European Competence Framework for Quantum Technologies and highlight the ethics within it. So the objective, as Oksana did already mention, is to provide a common language and reference framework for quantum technology education. So the tool for planning, mapping, and comparing education offers personal qualifications or also job requirements. So this is something that we are working together with Aarhus on our job post mapping on the competence framework. But it is, it is also used in the EQRC, the European Quantum Readiness Center, Oksana has already mentioned as one part for this accord they are using there is the competence framework for standardization of these educational efforts they are highlighting in the EQRC. So, 
we started already 2022 within the QD Edu project one time with our an iterative study following the Delphi method to yeah, get the first ideas, what we can include into this competence framework. And most of the answers were knowledge of or understanding of, so not really competences. So we started with a very contents oriented version and we find through expert discussions and also collecting, in, collecting input from the community. So we all every year or for each update invite the QT edu community to join for a discussion of the of our draft of the framework before finalizing it and so here on the right hand side we see the scientific papers we have already published around this work and then last summer i did 34 interviews with industry representatives for an industry needs analysis and doing analyzing all the stuff we did discuss about workforce development, about training needs. That, um, yeah, writing a 30 pages paper out of it is one way you can do it. And I'm working on a paper and try to shorten it a bit. And the other way is including it in the into the competence framework, extending extending the framework with the lessons learned from the interviews. So this is what. We now have in version 2.5 uh, and yeah, the paper is in progress. And the aim for the last year of QCATS is to provide a certification scheme to make training comparable to have a European reference for different training providers to yeah, enable acceptance of training and given provide a tool to yeah, for a common understanding what is meant by a title of a course. If it's aligned with the European scheme that we are providing within the quantum flagship CSA QPIX. So I'm not sure if that will work. If you're interested in the last version, published today. I'm very happy that there's not any more coming soon on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, just fresh, you are the first people that are now getting um, to see the, the new version and it is um, consists of three parts. So one part is this content map that we already had in version 2.0, so the version from last year. May I ask who already know it, the last version? Okay, a few people, but then I will, will say a few words about also the, the part from the last version. So we have this content map where we provide a structured way of all that is relevant for teaching and learning in quantum technologies. So the quantum background with the basic concepts, superposition is, for example, located here, and also the physical foundations. Then on the left-hand side, you have the core device technologies, the enabling technologies, laboratory techniques, and quantum hardware, different qubit types, for example, are located here. And then there are the systems and applications, so quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum networks, and communication. And then the last part, valorization. And if you are not sure what is meant with valorization, that's a problem because that is the section I want to go deeper now from the next slide on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Does it work? No. Okay. So this is now what's new in this version the proficiency triangle. So in the last version, we already had proficiency levels from A1 to C2 to yeah, provide a second dimension as an addition to the content map to really specify a personal qualification. So you that you cannot only say, okay, this is covered and this is not, but also on which level is it covered. And with the update, we spe now specify these levels for three proficiency areas. So the quantum concepts, this is rather in the direction of theoretical physics, the QT hardware and software engineering. So this is the 
quantum technology relevant engineering. And we will have a closer look on this triangle um, later. And the QT applications and strategies. So all the business, how to make money out of it, and also how to behave, behave responsible and ethical within quantum technologies. And with this, we uh, show nine different qualification profiles and you, you see here different coloring of these triangles to make yeah, give a one view comparison of the different profiles. So the top one is rather engineering hands-on oriented. The other one goes more in the direction of business, market analysis is it. So um, yeah, this is the three parts now in this version 2.5 of the framework. So I have already mentioned, this is the part we did already for the last version. And we want to take a closer look into the part of valorization. So here we have the industry landscape, market analysis, business strategy, entrepreneurship management. So all this business stuff. And then impact, responsibility, and awareness. So this is the part I want to take a closer look. So for each of these eight content domains, we have a details page with topics and maybe subtopics. And here for the impact and the responsibility, you see, for example, societal and environmental impact and responsibility, ethics, public communication and outreach, awareness raising, and also education and training. So this was a part from the last version of the framework. And now we want to take, I want to take a closer look on the new efficiency triangle. And the idea of the graphic is that you start in the middle at the A1 level, start to build an overview up to A2 level, and then you can specialize at starting from the B levels up to C2 the state of the art, the PhD level. And yeah, in the green top one, you have the terminology, the basic concepts and so on. In the blue one at the left, you have the functionalities, perform basic tasks on quantum technologies and work with them up to develop new systems. And then you have the white one. And in addition to this short keywords, I bought the Short descriptions for each of the levels. You see, you start from awareness, recognize the potential of QT, literacy, identify value, classify available applications and approaches, analyze opportunities, and advise or develop strategies. So this is the short version of the level descriptions. And for each level, we also have this long version where we describe knowledge and skills, and in addition, the related um, content subdomains. So uh, provide the connection to the content map, the old version of the framework. And here at the A2 level, we explicitly state ethical implications, creating strong awareness on the not only the economic impact, responsibility aspects, and how to communicate about quantum technologies. So this is what we provide as, as we had the question, how to argue why to include ethics. At least this could be one possibility to yeah, state the relevance. And yeah, based on this, this level descriptions, we um, prepared a map of the nine profiles we identified. And I don't want to take a closer look to all these profiles. And, but yeah, just to mention, we have a details page also for each of these profiles with the triangle and level descriptions again, a general description, description example personas based on the interviews, so more concrete how such a qualification a related job could look like, and the needs of, and suggestions. So what would be a good previous qualification and what training or learning steps are needed to reach this profile. So this is what you see here with the, the errors of previous qualification and then going down with training to, 
to the next profile. And yeah, this is how these pages look like. And at the first glimpse, you see the difference between the QT award with a person with a basic idea and the QT literate with a bit more um, idea what to do with quantum technologies and being prepared for the quantum for participating in the quantum workforce. And if you look into the suggested training modules, you will find that already at L1 level, it is desirable that impact and ethical implications are already covered. And then for the L2 level, it's explicitly yeah, stated within the descriptions. So this is my summary and my last slide. <laughs> we have published today the next version with the proficiency triangle and qualification profiles. And the ethics is covered in the content map as well as in the proficiency areas. And yeah, already for these fundamental profiles, it's definitely relevant and it appears again also in the higher level descriptions. So we need now we need you, you for the innovative ideas and the approaches how to yeah, make this real, what we provide, uh, yeah, what we say that we need it. And I'm always happy to get your feedback for the next update. Thank you. What I didn't tell you is that Francisca was starting to be a teacher. And she really wanted to do teacher work, but we kind of trapped her a little bit in the department. But now what she did never know that she will be language teacher, no? Because she started to be physics teacher and what was your second subject? Math. A math. And now what is she doing? She's teaching a common language to the community of, <laughs> of God of Ecosystem. So congratulations, Francisca. You also made it to teach. We have time for three, three questions, please. So I think that uh, Natalia was first, and then Peter, and then we can get from So, Natasha, I'm sorry, it's my, my sister name is Natalia, so you actually say Natasha. So that's why I automatically go to the full name. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It's really, really interesting and very interested to, um, to learn more about the updated competency framework. Um, I was interested, you mentioned role mapping and complications with industry. And I'm wondering if you're seeing um, more roles specifically around things like societal impact ethics, um, policy in quantum computing organizations, or if you think that's kind of further further in the future. Uh, not much. No, I did not explicitly ask for ethics. And I think there were one or two remarks going into this direction at the editions at the end of the interview. But what I, is definitely there in industry is people who are in this business perspective, looking for new opportunities, where to, uh, how to get started, what would be good ideas for the, the company um, strategy. And I think for them, it is really important to be aware of impact and responsibility aspects. Sure. So next question is the last from Peter. We have to shout out loud. I'll start shouting. I was wondering um, what you aim to do with the profiles. So I understand that this that you plot profiles uh, and you make research of people. But what are you going to do now? Are you going to yeah. require that the European Union only hires a free people? No, no. <laughs> or... Yeah, that's if certain examples of what would be interesting for where to develop training uh, or also master programs, for example. So to yeah, give the 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 stand. And that's um, some examples of what is interesting in industry, what is discussed from industry. And yeah, to provide maybe not even only the nine profiles that we identified, but such a triangle with the specific coloring for each 
training course or master program to give a first view idea of what is the focus of the um, course or whatever. Now I'm the head of the MQCC, uh, which has been uh, uh, set. It's a promotion. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Uh, and I, I say, okay, yeah, in contrast to what I should say, uh, we have only 20% uh, uh, age five uh, people who do lots of ethics. Uh, and there's an eighty percent which doesn't have it. It's just we physics nerds. But as the whole company, the whole organization, as for the professionals show it, we are with ethics, so we don't need training. Is that is that something which you would accept? Can, can you apply the profile also on the level of an organization? Ooh, ooh that's a tough question. Very <laughs> good one. That's it's a, something we did not think about. Our thesis of, uh, yeah. So for now, it was rather the idea to yeah, map personal qualification or job requirements for an, an, one individual that is going to be hired for the company, for example, and provide a tool, maybe also for companies to specify what they need for the position. So to say, okay, we, we for this specific position, we need Essex, or we don't need it, and so on to yeah, create something like the profiles for a specific job. This is something we are working on with the colleagues from ours. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is very, yeah, at least you could uh, apply it to each person in the team and make an overlap. Oh, that's a nice question. And then uh, you can also see if you use transparency of the triangle, what is covered by the whole team and what is covered by a part of the team. I think we're getting an next research project. So I'm, I'm very happy to discuss also later on. Yes. I'm so sorry, I'm only here for today. I have another talk tomorrow, but I'm very happy to discuss. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we would give one short question last, and then we go to the next speaker, sorry. Yes, one of the questions about thinking universities will label uh, their courses with this framework, because red language courses, they uh, do have, you know, you acquire A1, B1, uh, and if you do, right, does an AI course then also have <laughs> Yeah, I think it's good will be done within the DigiQ project, uh, Digital Quant Enhanced Quantum Master Programs, where they, they it is under the lead of the AUS colleagues, where different universities come together and provide courses in a digital way and student exchange and all this stuff within quantum technologies. And they also agreed that they will use the competence framework to map and compare their courses. and. I hope that each of them will provide such a triangle for each course. But as it's just published, we have to see how it is accepted by the community and what we have to change for the next update. Thank you very much, Francisca. This was fun. We are now uh, about to have our third speaker, so I will do a little bit of job, job of Zach. Check. I'm doing it well, yeah. And uh, I would like to invite, uh, now it's the first time I will pronounce the name, I hope it's correct, Josephine Zmaia. Yeah, or Josephine, or I go by Josie. Josie, so Josie is coming to talk to us about developing the modular research base. For also, that should be Joan, not Jane. Where? My co-author. Ah. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit about uh, Josephine. She's doing a, her PhD in the group of physics education research in Colorado. And I love this group, by the way. I use a lot of materials from them. And uh, uh, she was very enthusiastically passionate about the quantum physics and uh, also stand upon the fact that teaching can be as propelling as anti-propelling your enthusiasm. <laughs> and based on this kind of take-in from her study, she decided to do physics education research 
instead of physics, but she still sits on quantum. Please, uh, Jesse, Josie, Josie, <laughs> no, no, come, uh, the stage is yours. Can folks hear me with the online stuff? Great. Yeah, so uh, as mentioned, thanks Oksana. Um, I'm Josie Meyer. Um, I'm a graduate student at the University of Colorado Boulder in the Physics Education Research Group. Um, but most of the work that I'm gonna be talking about today, um, so I do a variety of things around, work around you know, how to effectively and inclusively teach uh, quantum computing and quantum information, but I'm going to be talking specifically about uh, some of the work that I'm doing uh, with a grassroots initiative known as the Quantum Ethics Project, specifically around modular curricula for how to teach quantum ethics in the quantum classroom. I don't have access to click. Maybe the button to the right, and I want for me this one. Let's try. Uh, yeah. Okay, now it's working. Um, so first of all, I just want to, you know, talking about what is quantum ethics as an academic discipline. Um, why teach it? This is, I'm probably mostly preaching to the choir, but then the real question is, why are we not? And then how can we respond to that question? Um, what does the literature say about how to do this effectively? And then how we're doing this in practice and making it with a scalable approach that all sorts of instructors, even without necessarily this training in pedagogy and ethics, can use to incorporate ethical discussions throughout their classes. Um, so, yeah, in terms of, I'll, I just will tend to start with, and of course, the my acronym is covered up by the box, but designing for her, as I will sometimes describe for what it, um, what we want 21st century quantum education to look like but it needs to be holistic. So again, this is a theme that we keep seeing. Um, okay. Um, yeah, that the, that we need the conceptual fluency and technical skills, but also social responsibility if to the, especially as these technologies start to become, uh, or become commercialized and this becomes a real part of, uh, and real world and not just science fiction. Um, it needs to be equity oriented. And as this graphic reminds us, that means actually centering the needs of students that would otherwise have been excluded from education, not just simply trying to boost everyone up with the same strategies. And finally, it needs to be research based. There's a bunch of folks out there that have been studying how to teach uh, physics, how to teach computer science effectively. And there's a, a fair number of us that are doing work on how to how to teach quantum computing, quantum information effectively right now. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's listen to the folks that actually have been spending their careers studying how to do this effectively and learn the lessons rather than um, thinking that we all know the, know the best um, just because, well, I was taught this way and it worked. And that's so much of how education often ends up being in practice. So then what specifically is quantum ethics? So as we define it um, in the quantum ethics project, um, quantum ethics is a field of study concerned with social, economic, political implications of quantum technology, basically ensuring that quantum tech is used for the greatest and most equitable public good. Um, we do borrow a fair amount from AI ethics, but there's also, of course, as has been mentioned in some of the previous talks, quantum specific issues we need to be thinking about too, and also, you know, borrowing from the, um, especially the frameworks often in the UK around like responsible innovation, useful starting point. But, you know, again, how can we focus a lot of this on quantum specifically? And these are just some of the various ethical issues that we talk about. We can go back to the slide if folks want to, but I think we're largely aware of the, these general um, themes have been coming up in throughout discussions. Um, so then the next question is, why would we want to teach quantum ethics in the classroom? Um, well, it builds a quantum ready workforce. Uh, today's students are tomorrow's decision makers, whether they're going to be technologists or in policy or whatever. And if we want them to be able to make decisions about products that are entering the marketplace, we should be 
or that should be a part of what it means to have a quantum ready workforce. Um, it's reaching students where they're at. STEM students, as we've mentioned, haven't been necessarily taking those philosophy and humanities classes. And if they are, they're checking, doing it to check a box and tuning out. Um, it makes quantum more relevant to values often held by marginalized students. This is another thing we've seen in the literature over and over again. If you want to motivate, in particular, students, um, racial minorities, for instance, to study quantum in your diversity inclusion narrative, one of the best things to do is, um, rather than just trying to fit marginalized populations within existing course paradigms, is to start focusing on what actually matters to students' communities. And focusing on ethics and social responsibility in the course is a great way to do that um, and get past the idea that why am I learning this privileged conception of reality that isn't very, or why am I like disconnected from reality and basically just thinking about theory. Um, and finally, this is a great way to normalize public good, at, you know, in terms of what it does, what it means to do quantum, not an afterthought if we're teaching it in our courses. Um, so then the next question is, why do it now? And so here I like to refer back to the Gartner hype cycle, which basically points out that for a while, whenever there's a new technology, the media will take it, blow it well up past its initial, uh, you know, its, its actual technical merit. And then the negative hype comes in and says, wait a second, this technology is worthless. And so people are talking about it a lot when it's near the top. But the, and then only much later does the technology start to come down to earth again and then peak in terms of what people are talking with at approximately what the, or what the technology's actual societal value ends up being. So the problem is when we talk about things like AI ethics, we tend to be talking about it here when, say, ChatGPT is released. Lots of people are talking about it, but because we're doing it at, while the technology is close to, or is starting to approach some mature use cases after all this hype, it's too little, too late, because the technological development has been happening while everyone's focused on the hype bubble. Um, quantum ethics, we have the opportunity basically to catch it right here at the top of the hype, hype cycle. So while everyone is talking about quantum computing, for instance, but quantum computing is not actually having that many relevant use cases, but, all, but everyone is talking about it, policymakers are talking about it, and the technologists are busy doing all the work needed to make it mature later, we can actually work on making this the time that we talk about this, both to mitigate the negative hype um, by helping try to mitigate the hype cycle, great, and also to um, help keep the, and also so that when we do reach technological maturity, we're ready. Uh, why aren't we doing this more? Um, in talking with faculty, there's just very limited expertise, uh, concerns around disciplinary boundaries, and facilitation can be really challenging as a limited class time and fear of politicization. So the question then becomes, how do we teach quantum ethics effectively and in a way that the, um, in, or that instructors can actually do it? I'm gonna skip through this question for time. Um, so basically uh, talking about the various concepts in the literature, we can go back to any of these. Um, but then back to what the quantum ethics project provides. So really what we're trying to do is create modular research informed curricular materials that we can use to, or that are based on the best practices in literature without you know, not necessarily having to know them. And then that can be implemented in a classroom, whether you have 20 minutes or in like Alex's case, a full course. Um, so we have lecture slides, case studies, again, talking about the value of real world problems, instructional YouTube videos and more, curated reference lists, facilitation guides. Um, this is an example, for instance, of what some of our curriculum materials look like. And after this, I'm actually gonna be passing out some of the materials so you can look at them. We can pass them around um, and feel free to take some because I have a bunch of extras printed out. Um, but yeah, like in general, when it comes to using these effectively, there's this importance of framing um, the norms. We have a discussion norms worksheet. We highly recommend using that because if you want, if students just come in thinking about it as like a, or without really thinking about how the course is gonna be structured, there can be a lot of fear. But if we just talk through the norms originally, like this is how we're going to discuss it, then it depoliticizes a lot of it. And we can focus on the issues rather than people, rather than, um, people's fears about politicization. Um, 
as a facilitator, it can be really helpful to just be intellectually humble, admitting we don't know, we don't know everything. I don't know everything. And yet I'm still here providing curricular materials. So you certainly don't need to know everything. The students aren't going to know everything and it's okay. And if we model that, then we model the intellectual humility that it takes our students to actually build these um, sort of skills and learn to apply ethical frameworks amid controversy. A peer-to-peer -peer teaching model. Again, none of us are experts. And this is the beauty of the uh, model that we have, which is that anyone, even if you're completely not an expert in quantum ethics, can basically interact with your students as a peer and say, we can learn this together and it will work. Um, this also means that these we have had a lot of productivity, for instance, bringing technologists and folks that are trained in the humanities together and know almost nothing about quantum and having them work together on a case study. Um, because if nobody is claiming the position of expertise, then there's no, uh, or then there's no hierarchies of knowledge. And remembering the most important thing to do is to try. We're here to help you out. Uh, we have folks on our team that have been studying um, for years, the effective pedagogies of how to teach quantum ethics. We want to make sure that, you know, again, as folks have been mentioning, that this gets incorporated everywhere. We want to make it doable. Um, and so, yeah, just some takeaways. And again, we can talk a little bit more later if you want offline about specifically the strategies that we use, the research-based methods. I've skipped that here for time. But for educators, quantum ethics education can be challenging. You know, there are a lot of barriers to it, but we've spent our time looking at what the barriers are to educators and working around them. We want this to be doable and we believe it is. Um, and, you know, we are aware of what the challenges are. We want to make it possible. For curriculum developers, again, importance of integrating ethics throughout the curriculum. Um, one of the things we have with our, like, for instance, modular curricular worksheets is we might have, like, for instance, case study questions that can be matched with, you know, five or six different case studies around different quantum technologies, different sort of applications. For instance, maybe you want to talk about sustainability. Maybe you want to be talking about cybersecurity, um, you know, going back to those like five areas of ethical issues that we discussed earlier, as well as a variety of different quantum technologies, sensing, communications, computing. There are lots of opportunities to incorporate this throughout the class. If you want, if you just have like one single standalone class, it can feel like a requirement. But if every single course has one little case study in it, and we're building those methodologies throughout a program, then all of a sudden it becomes part of professional practice and not just a board module that you have to take. Again, no need to reinvent the wheel. We've been figuring this out. And finally, for policymakers, we absolutely need, uh, need you all's help basically to say, to incentivize this sort of work to be happening. Um, educators and institutions are going to bring this in. I know, in, for instance, in the U.S. context, engineering ethics was not really taught until ABET, the um, engineering accreditor for all U.S. institutions, started requiring it in the 2000s, and now it's considered a default part of what it means to educate ethics as an engineer. We can't wait for professional societies to have enough scandals to start mandating these. We, um, so we need to make it a policy that this is what it means to be teaching quantum in the 21st century. And so, you know, with things like the quantum competencies framework, uh, when it comes to if you are, you know, working on legislation, incentivizing research in how to teach this, incentivizing courses to actually teach this. You know, th those of us that are studying how to, how to do the work are out there. We just need now the support to make institutions follow. Um, funding for development of research-based quantum technology ethics curricula. Ideally, we shouldn't just be having this be a grassroots effort of graduate students and postdocs. That's what it is right now. Um, policy to incentivize us that throughout the curriculum. And yeah, here I just have a link to the, um, thank you. I have a link to the, some stuff about me specifically in the bottom right, as well as um, various links that you can, um, for the quantum ethics project. And then this, QR code here has a variety of things if you want to access our full bank of published curricular materials, publications, both some of my stuff that has nothing to do with the quantum ethics project, but also the, um, like, for instance, the paper that the quantum ethics project has about how we uh, called a holistic approach to ethics education about how we do this. Um, curricular materials, um, slides to this lecture. So there's a whole wealth of resources in here if this is something that you want to 
be interested in. And again, if you're an educator or somebody who's interested in using these materials, we're happy to work with you and show you how you can integrate them in your course. Thanks a lot. I feel like we have a gold mine here and there are already two questions. So one will come on the way and we start with, uh, yes. So, um, thank you for your, uh, uh, I should say before the you know, question that I am a teacher and I have a lot of experience in responsible innovation in the area of new technologies. Mm -hmm. So because my questions are a little bit provocative. And um, so the first one is, um, you mentioned quantum ethics as a field of study, and I'm really curious as to whether you think we can actually already determine that quantum ethics is a field of study. Uh, and secondly, given your uh, your description of the Gartner uh, hype cycle, if we're just before the slope of enlight enlightenment, are we too early, in fact, to do quantum ethics? So these are two kind of challenging questions. That you yeah. Have. So two excellent questions. I'm going to say, so um, second one, are we too early? My answer would be, it depends on, or too early to do what outcome? We have the opportunity. So right now I would say, most people would say that we're at, or probably just after the peak of inflated expectations is depending on the quantum technology. For instance, I would say that Nobody's been focusing very much at, at all on hype on quantum sensing, and yet that's the most re real world quantum information use t case technology in the short term. Um, but I think that there's, there is, if we're concerned about a quantum winter and we want to talk about that, now is the time to start talking about that sort of scholarship. If we're concerned about, um, and that will actually help mitigate some of the tendency to rebound too low in the hype cycle. Um, I think the, the important thing is we just don't want to wait till we're at the slope of enlightenment because that has historically been the mistake that has been made. And if we wait till things have crashed too much and nobody is talking about quantum technologies, then we run the risk that we don't necessarily have the opportunity to be making a strong case for why we need to be talking about this. Whereas right now, everyone is talking about overhype. Um, the other question, do we think that quantum ethics is its own discipline and are we able to say that? And what I would dare say is the answer or we are stating this because we believe that stating it is what it makes to take this to make this come true. The quantum ethics project is a grassroots initiative. We don't have really the power, mainstay power of academia. We're not trying to. Basically, and I'll be talking about this in a later in my other presentation today. The way that the quantum ethics project started um, was when a friend and colleague of mine, Joan Arrow, basically decided people aren't talking about this. We don't want this to get monopolized by, for instance, we don't want the idea of quantum ethics to get monopolized by interests that, for instance, might be interested in taming it and trying to make it palatable um, to, uh, for instance, to or to every user and really limit its possibilities. We want, a, we want grassroots uh, organizations and academia alike to be able to participate in it early on. So we basically just declared it an academic discipline and then working by whatever needs to happen to make that happen. Do we believe it's a formal academic discipline? Does it matter? If we act as if it is, then it becomes one. If we act as if it's not, then we're forever subservient to whatever other academic disciplines are out there. Hmm. Thanks, Well, I think it's really interesting because I think a lot of this, um, in a way, I agree with you. You do have to announce work here. Yeah. Uh, but I see it's, it's a very interesting kind of strategizing positioning going on because I also am reading in published articles in Nature, for example, uh, the Stanford Responsible Quantum Group mm -hmm. had a paper out a few days ago, and they mentioned the field of responsible quantum technology. And I find this fascinating because a few of us worked in nanotechnologies over a decade yeah. ago, and we had I mean, two or three or four or five years of agonizing over what nanoethics is, what it could be, whether we need a nanoethics. So we mm -hmm. see in quantum, we've kind of skipped this step. Yeah. And it's quite fascinating. There's a lot of kind of conditioning going on. Yeah. Um, so that's just a comment to your yeah. uh, response. And again, I think that that is intentional because worst case scenario, we find that quantum ethics isn't needed. I think this conference just proves that hypothesis. But if we spend a whole bunch of time focusing on asking the question of whether it's needed, then we can't be actually doing the work that is needed to see whether it's needed, which I think the work that we are all doing in this room ends up proving itself. Mm -hmm. Mira, did you have a? Yeah. 
I mean, I would say it's both and. A uh, quantum ethics course is great if it's contextualized such that you're learning this is an important part of what it means to do quantum. Disembodied ethics education, the literature has shown over and over again, doesn't work and actually tends to backfire because if you just make it a requirement and you people do it, then they see that it as a box to check and then they start to resent ethics. And that is the last thing we want to have a culture of, which is that ethics is something that a box that you have to check and then you resent it and never want to touch ethics again for the rest of your life. Rather, it needs to become inculturated as a way of thinking. So framing a course like Alex's course in the broader context where everyone is talking about ethics and now we have a chance to zoom in on it is exactly the, uh, is a wonderful approach. Um, but if all you have is 10 minutes in one course, let's take those 10 minutes. And if all you have is that course, is Alex's course, let's take that opportunity. Right now, most students are coming out with no quantum ethics training at all. Um, but ideally, the vision should be that it's both and, that we see it everywhere. You know, a focused course is great, but a focused course by itself, if it's mandatory, will end up turning people off. And if it's elective, we'll only end up preaching to the choir. <laughs> well, I think that we are uh, about at a critical point now because lunch is coming soon and lunch is there. Please <laughs> apologize me because the lunch will come a bit faster because I would ask you to keep your questions for the lunch. Please sit next to Josie and we will skip your questions now, not because they are not interested, but just because we need to have one more talk. And uh, I would now close the session of, uh, of questions and thank you a lot, Josie, for having me. And I'm welcoming here uh, our final speaker before lunch. Yeah. This is a great honor, so you have to be fast. Yes, yeah, it's fast. It's fast. It's and uh, uh, so Vincent, I, I apologize for the incorrect manner. Yes, manner. Right. So Vincent uh, came from Berlin, especially for us today. And he's a futurist, and this is uh, this is how I learned uh, he is. And he's doing research and uh, teaching and writing on how to analyze the future and try to predict it and learn from the future. So usually we learn from the past, but uh, Wenzel will tell us about how to learn from the future. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Josie. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. I acknowledge my special role in being the only one between you and the lunch break. So <laughs> I will do it as quick as necessary and as uh, entertaining as possible. Um, as Oksana said, I have a background in future studies. Uh, what does it mean to learn from the future is something that I'm going to present to you today. Just as a brief introduction, when I'm talking about futures, I'm actually talking about the visions of the future that we have, particularly developers have, and those visions are inscribed into the technology later. Thus, reflecting on those visions becomes important. Um, I think this would already be done, so I could stop my talk here, but of course I'm going to tell you about how we're doing this. Uh, what I'm presenting to you is work I've done with colleagues of mine at the Berlin Ethics Lab at the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, just as a full disclosure, I'm also working at the Austrian Institute of Technology, uh, where I do similar work, but this work here uh, is coming from the Technical University of Berlin. Um, I'm also here in the panel of education. Um, Colleagues of mine also train uh, uh, developers uh, or students to become engineers on technical ethics or ethics of technology. Um, I'm not so much in the education part of students, I'm rather in the field of capacity building, developing trainings for developers. Okay, uh, to, 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 let me see how I can click those slides. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This would also work, right? Okay. So uh, just as a short yeah. overview, um, I'm going to talk about two things here, just briefly about the background of our work, namely how tech visions prefigure technological development, and also about something that we call epistemic tools for ethical reflection and how those tools actually support um, ethical reflection processes during tech development processes. So let's start with the uh, first part here. Um, I think the people that have a background in STS probably know this example. It's just here to explain that uh, artifacts have politics, as Langdon Wiener uh, explained with this simple example of a bridge. Um, it might show, it might just look like a simple bridge, but what you cannot see on this picture is that behind this bridge, there's actually a very beautiful beach. And this beautiful beach can only be reached by car uh, because this bridge is very low. It does not allow other vehicles, for example, buses to come through. Um, at the time this bridge was built, uh, buses were usually used by people that are rather on the low income side, thus preventing people with low income in brackets, also often people with another uh, with, a, with a darker skin color, um, preventing them to actually reach this uh, the beach that is behind this bridge. So again, here as long as, as Wiener showed, politics uh, artifacts have politics and also separate uh, or have a social impact. One way we can also see this today with uh, when we're talking about new and emerging technologies. This, for example, the robot. When we, when we Google the robot or when we look for visions of robots, uh, they are often more associated with whiteness, for example. So the here also the worldview of developers, we could assume, um, as long as the developers working on this robots are actually have a white skin color, are also inscribed into this technology. This is why, of course, the diversity in tech development becomes necessary. Um, basically, what we can see here is that those visions of technology or visions of future in general, they are shaping current decisions and actions uh, in the context of the development of technologies. And thus, it becomes important to have a critical and also an ethical reflection of those visions to understand, or it may, here, a critical reflection means to understand what are the biases, what are the assumptions, what is maybe also the cultural background that I bring uh, into this vision uh, or into the tech development to basically enable an expansion of design possibilities. I think here I highlighted the moment of expansion of design possibilities so also to frame ethics here in this context and also ethical reflection rather as, um, as an enabler and not a restrictor. So we're not talking about ethics of, hey, you should not do this and this, but rather talking about ethics as, hey, become aware of the values that you carry and also bring in other values that might be important to like uh, create a more, uh, uh, um, yeah, to create a better world or whatever this better means in this case. Um, usually when, so yeah, coming to the next point, integral, in, integrating ethical reflection within the technical, tech development process, sorry. Uh, usually this is a very stereotypical, but also of course exaggerated picture of how tech development works. People are here in this case also white men are sitting at a table and they're discussing ethics. Then there's this one guy who might think, well, actually there might be a problem with some vulnerable group or maybe with the environment. And then someone else says, okay, well, hmm, we do not see any ethical re uh, relevant issues. So let's take this down and all on the other, all on the table agree. And then the discussion is closed and they continue uh, to go on with the early work, uh, with the daily work. Um, we try to intervene in those uh, situations and try to process or produce frameworks that actually guide an ethical reflection within the tech development process. And we do this um, through using um, epistemic tools and they're based on actually two steps. The first one is to make the visions that are held by the developers to make them explicit. Oftentimes these visions are very implicit and they're guiding the actions of the developers. And you can make them explicit, for example, through something that is called world building or through speculation, through, I would say, methods of foresight. But those methods are not meant to foresee the future or to, to explore the future, but they're rather meant to state what people are currently assuming about the future. Thus, future studies of foresight here becomes a self-reflectory space. 
If you want to learn more about this, uh, Nele Fischer and I wrote a paper in the Journal of Future Studies called Building Possible Worlds, a speculation-based framework to reflect on images of the future. Um, then after we have those images of the future, we have those visions played out, we can deconstruct them, we can assess the, uh, the, 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 the values, we can understand what does better mean when developers are talking about better worlds, and of course we can debate better for whom and how should we change it, which is then in the second step, namely in redesigning those visions. So when we are talking about ethical reflection, about integrating ethics into the development process, what we're doing here is working First, deconstructing, reconstructing, second, reconstructing visions of emerging technologies. This is usually done upstream, so very early in the development process, but uh, what we learned is that it needs to be done throughout the whole development process, different methods and different steps. And it is aimed at, uh, again, guiding or giving, reflecting the guiding that is, um, well, reflecting the guidance, or reflecting, well, it allows to guide the developers action. Uh, and again, it's specifically aimed at um, developer teams of emerging technologies and also helps with stakeholder integration. So these are some examples for the epistemic tools I was referring to. Usually they come in form of canvases, um, either in uh, physical spaces, so in in-person workshops or more, sometimes also in digital workshops. This one here, for example, is a stakeholder map which allows to map all the different stakeholders that might be uh, become, that might become relevant when the technology is uh, established in the society. Um, this one here is called an interaction journey. What the interaction journey does is it imagines a future use case and then tries to understand what happens before, during, and after those use, this use case or this user situation. And how are the different stakeholders that we met out before are impacted by this technology? Uh, the third one here, this is also just an example, is a, we call it implication plan. It's for assessing potential future implications by giving the, um, the, the participants of this um, workshop a framework. Uh, it starts with a vision of an emerging technology or a use case in the middle. And then we try to anticipate what could be impacts in, um, in the societal, technical, or on a rather systematic field, uh, but also what are the prefigurations that need to be established so that this use case situation can happen. So this tool here opens up the contextual space, the social technical contextual space of this emerging technology, if it would be established in society. And just a, a brief quote here from a participant who said, the workshop created the structured framework for dialogue on ethical issues, which normally takes place informally and only between individuals or maybe in this stereotypical exaggerated situation that I showed you before. Um, so I saw that I only have one minute, so I'll make it quick here. So some signs so far, what we learned is that developers actually, uh, that so first, Doing this upstream can help to shape the vision and thus also to help to impact somehow the development um, or the, the result that comes out. Um, developers actually ask for such an open space for ethical reflection, and they also ask for guidance through those tools, but also, of course, through the facilitator's expertise. Speculation is a fruitful starting ground for dialogue. It makes fun, it's engaging, it's creative. Um, not everybody works fine with that, but sometimes we need a little bit of push. And also, of course, but I think this is not, nothing new, ethical reflection of specific technology might stretch beyond the scope of the technology itself. So oftentimes we are working together with startups. So it helps to have other people on board as well from marketing, from C, uh, the CEO, for example, um, sometimes also HR. So just have a different perspective because when we're talking about embedding technologies, it's not only about the technology itself, but it's sometimes also about the business model uh, and about like larger contexts. Okay, uh, if you want to read more on this, this is the advertisement slide. Um, there's going to be an upcoming special issue on the topic of integrating ethics in the Journal of Responsible Innovation, which will be published in uh, hopefully in August or September, depending on past the review are. And uh, in this journal, which I'm guest editing, in this journal there will also be an article on the implication fan where you have. 15 pages to learn more about the tool that I just presented. And if you have any questions, feel free to talk to me. Thank you.
Let's and get the bigger prize this evening for the fastest talk. <laughs> and now let's see who gets the prize for the fastest question. <laughs> Please. Yeah, I really like this work. Um, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because I just had a quick look at your um, paper while you were talking, the one about future possible world. Yeah. Um, 20 years of constructive technology assessment, 20 years of looking at expectations, sociology of expectations, science and technology studies combined with TA, not mentioned at all in any of your work. I'm curious why. Uh, that's actually not true. I mean, the background I'm working on here mainly feeds on hermeneutic TA. In my yep. business, so I mean, Unberg, business assessment on the left. Um, and also the whole, especially, I think, especially in this paper, I think there's a chapter that is heavily drawing from future studies, which might be though, um, the fields are very much overlapping and they are talking about very similar things, just in different words. Mm -hmm. And but like the authors are in it, uh, uh, are of them, are of, they are. This is what I'm feeding on. Yeah, so, well, I, exactly. I was just curious. Um, well, I told you I was being devil's advocate. I fully support what you're doing. So, the it's just when I looked at the reference, the citations, yeah. and the discussion, sociology of expectations is built on revealing what uh, communities of actors think about the future, and this is the very basis of your talk, actually. Absolutely. And so, I was just wondering um, why it wasn't cited that that kind of community. It is. Yeah, Ronald Dahl is. Uh, it is cited. Yeah, Definitely. yeah. Okay, all right. Well, we can have a discussion yeah, about that. But Brown, you're the paper sure. uncontested future. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Thank you very much. Thank you. So unity paid here. We we'll sit next, sit next to each other at lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? That's it. Yes. Yeah, let's see. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nelson. And thanks, Oksana, for our moderation. Uh, yeah. Another example that physicists like kind of diagrams is Feynman diagrams. So um, here we're using uh, kind of diagrams to teach quantum to a uh, younger audience with hopefully with fewer mathematical prerequisites, uh, with fewer mathematical prerequisites. Um, this is called the Via Calculus. It was invented in around 2007 uh, uh, by my research group at the University of Oxford, but since has been used in, uh, these diagrams has been used in over 250 research papers. And uh, in the recent three years, 10 quantum computing research papers from uh, sorry, quantum computing research papers from 10 companies. So um, you're, you just draw any quantum computation on any number of qubits as, as these in terms of just graphs where the nodes are these two kinds of spiders. Uh, we call them spiders because they've got any number of legs. Um, and uh, the Brock notation here is down here, but um, the high school students don't need to look at the Brock notation. And um, Kind of uh, achievement is that any equalities of two qubit linear maps, if two qubit linear maps, say matrices, say quantum circuits, if they're mathematically equal, then there always exists a proof that they are equal using eight, eight just eight total rules. So here's the eight rules. So um, this is quite powerful as reasoning. I will just say a tiny bit of intuition would be that just like in quantum circuits, if you have wires in parallel, then that's using tensor, that, that exactly represents the tensor products of processes. And um, this is kind of an alternate to kind of matrix multiplication, Hilbert space bracket notation ways to teach quantum where you don't need to require any linear algebra in order to be able to prove quite powerful things in quantum computation. Um, since last year, our paper at Continuum also shows you can prove any qualities of all finite dimensional linear maps. So any finite dimensional Hilbert space using just a finite number of rules. So just an extension of this calculus also works um, in any finite dimensions, which means we can also do things beyond qubits in, in this maybe for education, but that's kind of far off in the future. So um, this is, I'll mostly talk about our pilot study. 
This is an eight week course for high school students that we ran in around summer 2023. Um, we got a University of Oxford ethics approval. And so the age was from 16 to 19. We use samples to balance the demographics for some reasonable gender balance and also most having a majority, most of the students from state schools rather than private schools and also geographically from he doesn't um, high schools. So um, we submitted and uh, published a pre-study paper for peer review on the methodology before the study conference, which is quite common in social science experiments. Uh, although we didn't spread the application too widely because we got the word out already to over 700 applicants. And so, but we had a mind to have a sample size at the end of around 50 students to complete the course. And we did get more than 50 students. So this is quite a high retention rate for an eight week course that high school students are taking voluntarily in their spare time during their exam period. Um, and uh, the, it was an eight week course, one lecture that was on video per week, plus one tutorial with a class size online of 10 students to a tutor. And, and then two to three weeks for, two weeks for exam, plus some students asked for extensions. And um, we also had two sessions on careers in quantum and um, some games for learning and fun. And this is a poster of the, this is a flyer that we used for the promotions to recruit students. Uh, this was the textbook. So the lecture notes for this course is a, just kind of a few, the most, most of the chapters from this textbook, which is from 2023. It's meant for all ages. So this is some uh, Twitter, I think that was Twitter. Um, uh, post apparently a 10 year old liked it. <laughs> um, but we have not experimented on lower, younger than 16 due to ethics approval. And uh, <laughs> um, so, so uh, this is um, on the left is from the lecture notes, and on the right is a uh, student's notes from the course that we just like screenshot. So, so these diagrams, we have it so horizontally separation and spatial separation and vertically from bottom to top goes from past to the future. And so you can represent quantum information. By... So it's quite visual. Um, these lectures are supposed to be quite, they're quite fun. Maybe they're too fun. So that's why we haven't put them out yet. We need to make sure that they're... Um, <laughs> But we'll, we'll have to do some editing. We're planning to put all the lecture videos out. And we also have some quizzes so we could check their knowledge in between. Um, and uh, and um, I can show a bit of the course material. This is not the course material. This is how quantum teleportation would usually be taught. That's kind of a lot of marking notation. Um, this is a master's student from a University of Waterloo graduate course. And um, to a high school student, the um, matrix multiplication is actually only taught to less than one third of UK high school students, and it's only in the curriculum, but not tested, which means that um, it's very unrealistic to, at least in the UK, to expect high school students to know matrices and vectors. Um, so here's two rules up so I can then show how quantum teleportation looks like in this quantum picturalism way um, versus just identity. If you're doing a from left to right, just like seconds, if you are doing a rotation about the x-axis with angle zero, um, then it's identity. If you're doing about the z-axis with angle zero, then it's also identity. And the other two rules are fusion. This is basically like tensor network contraction, but with special kind of quantum nodes of the graph. So if you have at least one wire between any two same color spiders, then you can add the faces together. And so this effectively means that all the complex numbers that you need for qubit quantum mechanics, you can put them in just these phases, these real phases instead. Um, so the quantum teleportation in this example would be, this is just a circuit just drawn in this notation of this, this diagram instead. So this is your typical quantum teleportation circuit where the top two wires are for Alice and then Alice is sending a qubit state input here to Bob who has this last wire. And so this part is the bell state that Alice and Bob share. And so Alice does a measurement on her two qubits, a bell measurement, and then Bob has to do these corrections down here. And we can prove that this is the full circuit for the protocol using B0, B1 um, as bits, so out of zero or one on these measurement outcomes. And this is the this slide is the entire proof that 
um, using just the two rules on the previous slide, that this quantum teleportation circuit indeed is just the identity wire from Alice to Bob um, once Bob's done the right corrections. Um, this is in our pre-study paper, so you can check it out there. And uh, I just wanted to have a slide to list the concepts that were taught in the course, and most of these were tested in the final exam, kind of comprehensive three-question exam. There were some shut up and competing in the exam, but also some, also some um, making sure that there was a quantum processes and quantum communication multi-party protocols, which was, <laughs> which did also have um, more advanced kind of higher level topics in there as well. Um, I will just highlight that there was no mathematical prerequisites. Um, there, so we didn't have matrices or Brocken notation, no tensor product or complex numbers or trigonometry. They're all entirely encoded in just those diagrams, the eight rules that I showed earlier that from which you can derive all other possible rules. So um, to show some of the outcomes, we're still doing the data analysis quite rigorously, um, but we have all the exam scores. So we don't have all the demographic correlations and kind of more interesting um, nuanced exam, uh, but the scores are here. This was marked double blind by University of Oxford standards. So that's two professors and they just agree by more than 10 points than you need a third professor, third faculty member. And um, uh, greater than four and five students passed and around one and two under distinction, which is the highest score category in the UK grading system. Um, this was, uh, we, we did a filter, so uh, we'll leave some of the technical details to the paper, but basically we had a question in there that was as a question to test if it was like one of the definitions later on in the course to see if the students had paid attention, whether or not, since um, the students are uh, by so many any exam, even if it was mostly blank, would get a certificate from the University of Oxford. Um, so we had to somehow incentivize but also then and encourage participation without, but also not force it. And, and not make it dependent on a test score, rather than more about the experience. And um, without this filter, we still have um, over 35% distinction, and that's more than the fail those presented students who, I guess, failed under the grading system. Um, some of these, these questions are for, for graduate level, I would say, um, co comparative to the graduate level courses, um, maybe a subset of curriculum, considering that these students are spending about one third of the time that the equivalent university course with, and so therefore covering this content, but um, still going quite further technically than most high school education, than I would say any high school education in quantum mathematics. So um, uh, to kind of show a picture, this is zone of proximal development, which is used in education psychology to, to kind of picture that what um, a student on their own can in the sport and stuff, and then the students, even if with teaching, would um, need would not be able to touch the start green zone. This middle teal zone, um, I would say that this is where quantum at the high school level can be uh, in, and um, that's what this the study analysis will figure out just how much what what parts of quantum are in there. Um, finally, the the last um, comparison that we want to make for a follow up study is. But the, the bigger next study would be that we can compare, do two types of comparisons. One is between the high school level quantum and the university level quantum. So there's a there's been a University of Oxford two courses on this quantum picturalism, um, quantum to teach quantum information theory for a decade now, I think. And then there's also a university course that does it with kind of the more conventional formalism with rocket notation and linear algebra. Um, so we can contrast uh, these two different approaches to the teaching as, mm -hmm. at the university level, as well as contrast between the high school student performance and the university level performance. So um, that's what we'll be working on in the coming years. Thank you all very much. Um, thanks for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leah. That was really fascinating. Are there any questions? And we'll start in the back. Yeah. Should I use the online version for or Oh yeah, it would be better if you just I just put here on unmute and that's right. Yeah.
So um, I, I really like like what you do there. I follow the work for a while, although I didn't uh, dive too deep in there. But I like this idea of, of doing or understanding quantum mechanics with a not so mathematical formulation. Um, but I'm wondering what you can use it for. And I mean, it seems like you already, or you right now seem to test like what the outcomes of it going to be. But I'm wondering, is it useful for developing new algorithms in the end? So is that kind of thinking working for that? Or is it more for... I don't know, quantum engineers who want to have a basic understanding of how circuits work, or is it more for general public? They get a feeling about quantum quantum mechanics. So do you have any any target there or any, any knowledge, knowledge yet? yet? Uh, I have a good amount of knowledge. Um, I ran a tutorial at last year's Entrepreneur Quantum Week for just general audience, and it was quite general audience that we got. But um, some of the researchers that have been using and kind of quite uh, quite using the is quite actively, I guess some areas would be like quantum error correction, um, quantum software, quantum programming languages, um, um, some quantum hardware people quite like it, um, quantum chemistry, photonic quantum computing especially. So there's, it's kind of very broad, um, the, the, the different areas, and because this is also quite a very broad theoretical framework, I would say. Just quickly back, what do they like about it? Can you can you tell that? Um, I think that um, well, I can send you a few references. I have like a there's like a few like online quotes, or you can, I don't want to put words in other people's from other people's mouths, but um, but yeah. and I also add something. Yeah. So, what well, almost one fourth of all the talks in QPL <laughs> was practically using the desktop. So it's yeah. like a very research-oriented tool as well. Yeah. Uh, I think JC, you in that? Yeah. Um. So I've always, you know, thank you, Leah, for the talk. Obviously, this isn't the first time I've um seen a lot of this, and I think this is like a really, really cool. Um, I you know that I you know I you know I want to learn more about this approach and some other things, but this is kind of, you know, coming out of some of my work in like quantum assessment sort of things. How do you do it apples to apples comparison of how students are doing, say, who have learned quantum in pictures versus the, the circuit, um, quantum circuit formalism, say at the university level, like how, or how do you do like some sort of way of figuring out which is actually more effective for teaching? Well, um, we haven't done that. Last thought was the next. Yeah, but like, I'm thinking about this. Yeah, um, well, we can translate the exams that we gave to students who learn with different approaches. Just one of them, you show the exam with circuit model rocket notation, and the other, you show the exam with circuit model and or quantum, uh, quantum picturalism, because you can just translate circuits to quantum picturalism, but not the other way back. Since quantum picturalism is more general. Yeah. So you can just give them the same exam, maybe presented, just, just like translate between how like the kind of diagrams that you would use or the way the question is asked, but then it's the same question and same content. So you could, we did, um, we actually have specific classes in mind for this follow-up study that have existed at University of Oxford in the computer science and math departments. The physics department didn't have a suitable course for this, but um, yeah. that's all in planning um, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah I <laughs> so would love to talk at a later point about possibly ways that we could potentially translate the conceptual survey we're working on to this language. Yeah, I hope. Uh, I'm guessing most of the basic concepts would translate. Some, some of it not as well, but um, but um, that's ongoing work. Like now we can do Shor's algorithm with this, but maybe we don't want to do test scores. That that level of complexity. Is. <laughs> okay, not worried about the <laughs> the implications. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> and I think there are a couple more. So I understand that ZX Calculus is very useful to like code algorithms and make operations with your qubits, but I'm very curious, how do these high school students understand the basic concepts of quantum mechanics? Like, do they know what a quantum state is after doing this? <laughs> um, they know quantum state is more, I mean, they are learning the exact, like what they're learning is fully mathematically accurate in that every diagram represents a specific linear map. So but they have not been showed 
any of the math and they don't have the math knowledge to understand it anyway. So what do they understand at the end? Yeah, comment on this. I mean, you might also question if we're, even with the traditional introduction, whether you know what a quantum state is. If, if, if we're associating a quantum state with the, with the mathematical statement of it, then that's kind of begging the question somewhat, I suppose. So it, it might just be that we need to redefine. I mean, a quantum state is just an abstract entity anyway. So Yeah, I would say that it is the same math and you're just, if you use a matrix, you're just choosing the, that computational basis representation and this is a different representation of the same math. So all the relations that, that, that are, I guess, make it quantum are all in there. One more, we'll have the last question. Oh, I'm going to miss Thank you for I haven't seen your paper yet, but you've had more than a year of span now. And like, I, I have similar questions that you just answered, but maybe to look at it from a different perspective. Um, how did you get follow-up information from the students who were interested in this? did they self-select for the people who were interested in going into university studies in a field, field adjacent to this, as in people who are, were like, I too like fun mathematical formalisms, but were these primarily students that said, oh, I would really like this because it will give me a head start, or were they just students who were looking for a summer program? So, so we have technical study, but we did not use the, most of the pre-study information to do the selection. The selection was mainly just like demographic diversity. If we did not select based off, like even though if we if we had selected that, if the students had already known, oh, I've been studying interested in quantum for years, I was like, then they would do better on the test. But we chose not to do that. We didn't factor that into the random selection. No, but I'm not uh, it was that what the question was? So do you have the demographic information on, you know, were they there for a particular reason? Or maybe now do you have information about how many of them percentage-wise compared to the average of the who went to a field of the Oh, uh, yeah. There's a yeah. yeah. So uh, I guess two parts of that answer. One is that it's been less than a year, so they have, those students are still in high school. Um, and then this, and then the second answer is that uh, we wouldn't collect that information because of the ethics approval. We're not allowed to contact minors after we've interacted, after the conclusion of the course. Because, you know, you're 19 and 18, so some of them are not minors. But if you don't Yeah, but, but the, the ethics approval was for all the students of the course. So we didn't kind of, it, it was, we had anonymized all the data, the contact information. Only a few, very four of us could handle the data safely. So, so it was just, it, 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 we just couldn't do it like logistically unless we kind of ran so with ethics approval for two long. Long. Yeah. I'll, I'll wrap up um, the discussion there so that we, we move on to the next week. But let's thank Leah again for her fantastic. <laughs>
what we do a lot is that we figure when it comes to interdisciplinarity, when it comes to current technologies, if you get the people excited and on the right track, if they ever find the train to go to Hogwarts, they stick to the train to Hogwarts for the next years. So to structure this talk, I decided to go a little bit with like our main findings in terms of how to think about quantum and quantum education specifically during the last two years. So the lab is existing for two years. We're mainly financed by an outreach and education project of the BMBF, so of the Federal Ministry for Research and Education. So one problem we figured is definitely the increased demand for abstract thinking. And what we've seen before in this terms of like having more practical solutions is something which is one solution, like to change the medium. And I will come later back to this. But what we definitely see here as well is that we have a huge gap between specifically Western school systems and the needed knowledge. So what we figure is, um, like was told before, that if you say, okay, we are very very uh, confident that all our students can basically handle matrix calculations, that's not great. But what we figured is that this abstract thinking also reveals actually trust building challenges and problems within the education system early on. So one problem we see here and we see in our, our uh, daily work with politicians, but also with our students, is that we first have a trust building problem that the school system is not really much matching what we see here and that we need to find a way to enable the abstract thinking. So the second thing we definitely see is that interdisciplinarity is inherent. So interdisciplinarity is not a nice add-on that you basically can have when we're talking about quantum technologies. Quantum technologies are by definition interdisciplinary, at least if you count physics, computer science, electrical engineering, and mathematics as disciplines. So when we talk specifically about the application side, when we talk about like challenges coming for society, then it will never be just one discipline. So the approach that we need to introduce interdisciplinarity is for us more an inherent problem here because it is coming with the technology itself. It is coming, it is there, it is not nice to have. Um, and what we see here again is that we reveal trust building challenges and problems within the education system early on. And we can see that this interdisciplinarity um, releases a lot of challenges, a lot of research potential, um, and a lot of room for engagement here. When we look at um, quantum technologies as a responsibility, then we see that we find a perfect match here. So when we talk about quantum technologies and specifically about quantum computing, then we have the potential to overcome challenges. Classical computing is maybe not able to overcome. We've heard just today, with IBM, sometimes we see challenges and we overcome them, and then there is a classical algorithm coming right after solving these challenges. But actually, what we what we know is that thinking about the consequence of these technologies of tomorrow is necessary by staying true to the technology. So what we try to do here is specifically with our programs, also with our um, young quantum social scientists, with what this um, YQS and Hispanic work, is that we try to think about the consequences of the technology. We will see tomorrow with the application of the quantum technologies of the second generation already today. And one, one part of this is promoting responsibility in quantum technologies and having interdisciplinary teams. So what we have is that we have each year a stipendium report with students coming from very different disciplines. So by now we have people from um, the medical sector, from physics, we have people from quantum technology master's program, but we also have political scientists in the problem. In the program, we have um, one student studying psychology in the program. We take all these people together, working on the challenges. What we also find is that it's very easier to get our students engaged, actually, with quantum technologies or with math if they see the purpose. So we see that purpose-driven learning is working way better. If we can overcome the question about for what do I need this? If we can overcome the why should we actually learn to work with each other from these different disciplines, if we are offering a clear purpose before starting to say, okay, no matter with, with what medium to teach them, 
this is working very well. And we also can see that working together with very different disciplines, specifically in this field, leads to new and sometimes not doable, sometimes very, very doable ideas in this field. So these three approaches basically show a little bit of what we try to do within the different pillars of this lab. Um, what we what we do now is, because I promise that I will basically talk about how we change the people to the next platform, is that we work with different measurements. One thing what we do is working together um, with artists and together with Puzzle X, for example, on bringing art as a language into quantum technologies, which is working so far very well. So what we try to do is, for example, when it is about public outreach and public communication is that we work together with artists to basically get the people excited. It doesn't matter for the people who are not engaging with the technology itself, but more of like the results of the technology. It doesn't matter so much if they really understand what superposition is, but what for citizens matter really much is like, how will that change technology, change our lives? What, how will that happen? And if you want to get them excited, then you need to find a language and to something to translate that they are really interested in. And this is why, for example, trying to change the platform for the people who are just interested citizens or who are just impacted by quantum technologies during art, with arts. Um, we build also a learning platform, which is building up on where the people are, how they will basically be affected by quantum technologies in future. Um, for the students, we try to give them early access to research and specifically their own research. So we really try to make them engaging in their own research and their own topics. It's not so much relevant if this is really something which will be published the next two years. It's more about trying to enabling their own paths and finding their purpose in engaging further with the topic. We try definitely to do this interdisciplinary, which means that we try to explain the topics, that we try to explain problems and approach them from different directions, from different disciplines, and also to engage with them in different disciplines altogether. Um, what works really well is um, cross-teaching, social sciences, natural sciences, and vice versa. As you can imagine, it's most of the time a little bit easier for the natural scientists to find a way to the social scientists than for social scientists to find a way to plant physics. We can see this. And these are the ways where we try to change, to change the way we think about quantum technologies. So if I want to summarize in short, what I would like you to take away out of this um, little talk here with my Timus, and I nearly made it 11 minutes, is first, we have interdisciplinarity here. It's not about like, do we need interdisciplinarity? It's how do we deal with the interdisciplinarity of this topic? It's not so much about how do we include the people outside there into quantum physics or into quantum technologies, it's how do we integrate technologies for the people out there so that they have actually an idea about how this changes their lives. And specifically for, for the young people and for our young quantum social scientists, how we call them in this case, is a little bit more about how to showing them the path and the, the platform than actually building the train and sit, sitting them into the train. If they don't want to, to go into this train by themselves, in our experience, it doesn't matter if they end up in the train. They will just not do anything. Yeah, so this is what we do. And this is basically how we bottom up, by the way, also build our lab and our learning platform. If you're interested in hearing more about it than 10 minutes, then you're always free to contact me. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabienne. Any questions uh, from the audience? And then Asana. Um, yeah, I'm uh, curious uh, on the one hand, when you say what we do, I mean, maybe elaborate a little bit more on sort of the purpose of the quantum social lab. So is it kind of integrated? Is, is it more how you, similar to what we heard earlier, how you're teaching quantum and so on? Or is there also, are you, um, yeah, sort of that, that I'm, I'm, I haven't quite grasped. And then on uh, specifically on arts and quantum, 
Um, I'm curious whether you faced the the challenge at all. And I know we have a panel tomorrow, so I don't want to uh, no, talk too much about it. But um, I think what I've seen that there is a risk that then, especially in, in a general audience, um, that there's a kind of oversimplification of quantum and that, that there's a perception of, oh, you're not, um, especially, you know, you don't have quantum computers yet. So you're doing art with it and that's kind of dismissed. I mean, it's also really dismissive, of course, towards art, but kind of those, oh, is that all that those computers are good for in a way? That's kind of a bit provocative stated. And I'm wondering whether you've perceived any of that or how you would respond to that or how you, yeah, see that. Okay, so to the first question. So the kind of social lab has four pillars. One is education, where we basically educate different um, schools. It's called the Technical University of Munich. So we are in an American school system now. Um, so we are mainly concentrating on um, teaching the social science and the political sciences, the technical side, but also vice versa because of this double affiliation. Um, we are also doing research on the challenges like global justice, etc., on quantum technologies in the research pillar. We have a public outreach pillar and then we have a policy pillar where we basically give recommendations to different um, stakeholders within the policy sphere. So, for example, giving recommendations to the ministries, et cetera, having projects with different um, parts of um, United Nations organizations, et cetera. And these are four pillars. And depending on in which pillar we are, <laughs> it's the purpose. I was trying here to focus a little bit on, on education at this educational slot um, in this case. Um, but this is what we do, and we try to feed this into each other. And one reason why we started building up in 2022, we found the lab with the education was that we figured that there are not so many people at the moment in this interdisciplinary field who have enough knowledge to, from the start, just research on the social challenges and have enough quantum technology knowledge to basically really draw the top up um, there. So this is why we also started with this bottom-up approach, and this is why the, the education stream of the lab is, is very big at the moment and the others are catching up. Um, that's one question. The oversimplification of arts, um, in my experience, yes, it is a risk. On the other hand, I have to say, um, one critics we sometimes get that we have a very, yeah, systematic approach to art sometimes, that we have a lot of like modern, very digitally working artists, which is coming with the topic. So it is super challenging to find the, the line between not oversimplifying and, um, you have to be very careful and you have to also invest a lot of time in helping the artists to stay true to technology without basically them getting into the situation that they tell you, sorry, this is not art anymore and I, I'm not an illustrator or something. So this is a very fine line and it's very challenging. What we did basically was that we, with the, with the help also a lot of like Puzzle X, for example, um, and a huge network around it, we're reaching out for artists who said, okay, we want to go on a three years um, challenge with you. And we want to learn something about quantum technologies. And then we want to work with this and over the process of three years, basically develop art, which is art and which is something we in our artistic self-understanding can be proud of. On the other hand, where it's true to technology. But I can also say this is something which is a very specific approach and which is working because both sides are very open-minded because what you described is definitely one of the biggest challenge we have here. I'll, I'll wrap uh, this question up now, but, <laughs> but there's a great and very uh, comprehensive answer. Um, we'll come to you, Oksana, and then Rob online. I'll just ask to keep um, the, these questions in response. Oh, no, two more questions. Two oh, more sorry, questions. sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but I'll ask them to keep it brief so we can move on yeah. to the next session. So, um, Oksana? I would have very practical questions. Okay, that's why I. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One is how many people you usually have in these uh, groups of activities, just a number. And then um, who is financing this lab? And uh, uh, yeah, so how did it uh, form up? So who was the um, from? Yes. So in the groups of students, normally between 15 and 24 seminars. Um, if we have bigger lectures up to 100 max. 
um, depending on at which faculty it is taught. If I'm teaching in computer science, we have more students there. And we are financed mainly by um, the BMBF. So we have a two, nearly 2 million euro project for public outreach in quantum technologies we won in November, 2023. Is this related to Mini Quantum Valley or not? <laughs> we are collaborating with Munich Quantum Valley and MCQST, but we're not financed by one of them. So financially, completely not. Um, and last question, we will go over to Rob online. Hi, yeah. So um, this seems very interesting. So I'm a quantum physicist, but um, here in Grenoble, we organized an activity uh, where, we all, where we also had discussions imagining a sort of future of quantum technologies with a mixture of people, many students, uh, many social scientists. Well, it was a small group of maybe 20 people, but social scientists and so on. And one thing I really noticed was that we as a group were always attracted towards the dystopic future where the quantum technology ruins our lives. And I think we almost never came up with any uh, particular proposals for uh, whether technology would actually really be beneficial for our lives. And I wondered if you, this, so this is in France, uh, I wondered if you have a similar experience or or whether everyone was very optimistic in your discussions about the future about um about how technology affects our future life in general depending on on the group so if we talk to politicians we are also always in this dystopian ideas that we but there are also quantum technologies reduced basically to encryption and decryption um mm -hmm. this is happening in the political sphere so in the political sphere, we're doing a lot of groundwork trying to explain that there is a wide range of technologies we are talking about and that there are different scenarios. What helps a lot for us is that specifically, for example, in our project we have with the federal ministry, that we say, okay, we concentrate on three different um, areas. So we concentrate on mobility, medicine, banking, which gets you a little bit more out of this. And specifically, in the if you ask them specifically to think about, like, for example, climate change or medicine, it gets more positive and more realistic. But you really have to, to have these discussions in a reasonable way. You really have to provide a lot of work before in like preparing the discussion is my experience. If you just say, okay, let's talk about future or it, if it's not really targeted to specific questions, you exactly end up in what you described. Um, but I think we found a good way in like preparing some of these discussions. So if you're interested in in, in also preparation material, just shoot me an email, I can send you. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. And let's thank Fabian again. Okay, and next in this session, we have Harry. Weidner, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm very sorry if I'm not. Weidner, um, so I, you know, like a like Germans. The Germans get it right. They're the only people that ever get it right. Oh, apologies. Um, <laughs> Carrie, a PhD from University of Colorado Boulder on quantum sensing, and then did a postdoc at Aarhus in Denmark, uh, fo focusing on experimental quantum simulation. And she now lectures at the Quantum Engineering Technology Lab at the University of Bristol. Perfect. Over to you, Carrie. Okay, you should be seeing my slides. Yes. Correct. Yes. Oh, yes. brilliant. All right, great. So I'm going to go ahead and start a stopwatch just so that I keep the time. Um, yeah. So uh, I would like first of all to say I'm sorry that I can't join in person this year. Um, among many other things, like it being a busy time of year, I managed to put my passport through the laundry a couple of weeks ago, and this in fact kills the passport. So I'm stuck in the UK until I can get another one, um, which is good fun. Uh, surprise trip to London. It's like setting money on fire. Um, but in uh, better news, I'm going to talk a little bit about this thing that I joined when I came to Bristol, the Center for Doctoral Training in Quantum Engineering. So what is going on here? What's going on? We call this the QECDT. Uh, it's a four-year, it's a cohort-based pro uh, program. One of the things I really like about it is it kind of takes the best of the UK and the US systems. And I did my PhD in the States, so I'm a bit biased. Uh, so we bring in students as a cohort 
Uh, these cohorts can vary in size from like nine to this year we have 18 because the UK Research Council found some money behind the couch and gave it to us. Uh, it's one training year where you take when you do coursework and whatnot, and that's what I'm going to focus on actually here, and then a three-year PhD. Uh, this is, for example, uh, the current cohort of students, uh, including some staff, uh, most of us with the gray hair, uh, at my alma mater. We take these students over to the U.S. Uh, so this pic uh, picture was taken a few weeks back. Uh, it was good fun. That's actually after which I washed my passport. Uh, we also engage in cultural activities like eating tacos. Uh, there were lots of tacos. Um, but the goal of the CDT is really to train, you know, what I call the holistic quantum engineer. Um, and the idea isn't necessarily uh, for, to, for us to sort of sit there and we train people to just go right into academia, because that is what the majority of our students don't do. Uh, they go into industry, they go into public policy, uh, they do all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, and very few of them actually stay in academia. It's just not lucrative. Um, and so a number of them are like, I'm going to go make money. Uh, they laugh at my salary. So what do the timeline looks like? Something like this. Uh, so in the first year, we do teach them some quantum. We bring in students from a variety of different backgrounds. I'm not going to lie to you and say that the majority of them aren't physicists, because the majority of them are actually physicists. Um, but we have students that come from pure engineering backgrounds, material science, computer science, mathematics. Um, I think we might have had a chemist in there. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, we teach them some quantum. So we do give them kind of a, a base level understanding. The ones that are physicists uh, usually say, ah, oh, you know, this isn't too bad. I've had it before. And the ones that are don't have a quantum background are like, this is the most difficult thing I've ever done. But you know, 95% of them pass on their first try and more, more like 100% of them pass on their second. Um, they also have some sort of units that they can choose, um, but we try to get them to work together um, in this first year. So what we have this, some, this thing called the Grand Challenge Project, where basically the idea is that they do something as a group that they couldn't do alone. And while this is fairly broad in what they could do, a number of students have written papers that we put on the archive uh, discussing quantum AI, for example. Um, but we've had, this has largely become public facing in subsequent years. So last year's group made a quantum board game. Um, I think the hardest part was actually making that fun. Um, this year's group is holding sort of like a, a TED Talks for you know, 17, 18 year old uh, finishing their A-level students. Um, and so they're going to have a quantum speaking competition. There's been a quantum podcast, all sorts of stuff. Um, and then we also, we force every single one of them into a laboratory, which is good fun, especially for me as an experimentalist. And the theorists run screaming from it, but they're also very happy they did it. But the really important bit is that we give them training in things that are outside of the quantum sphere. Uh, outreach training, they do outreach. They're like, why am I doing outreach? We, you know, we shovel, we shop them all off to a, a little town an hour out of Bristol and we say, okay, you know, go, go teach the public about the cool stuff that you do. And they come back and they're like, wow, that was really fun. Um, and then, you know, they, they learn entrepreneurship. They learn, uh, we give them some bespoke RRI training, other things like that. And this all happens within the first year, but there are bits that persist throughout the second and the third and the fourth year where they have to really put these skills into practice. Uh, for example, organizing their own, um, their own conferences, their own career fairs, and these types of things. So uh, what does it look like in Bristol? Well, they have their own office. That's really nice. Um, it's not this clean at all, um, but it is at the start. Uh, we have their own little seminar room that uh, you know, is bookable, and all of their lectures are held in there and all of the training. And here's the lab uh, where they can do build things like this. So it's an empty optics table and we tell them to basically go build an experiment that if they'd done it back in you know, the early 2000s or the early you know, 1980s or something would have won them a Nobel prize. Um, of course, they're not getting any Nobel prizes today, but you know, the idea is there. So that's kind of what we do. Now, the question then is, you know, we have this thing, we convinced the UK Research Council uh, EPSRC, that this is something worth doing. And they said, oh, yes, you know, this is all well and good. But then does it work? Um, so we've got 110 students that have come through 
the uh, the total CDT in the last decade. Um, they're primarily British. Uh, that's mostly due to rules of the funding agency. We can only have about 30% of our cohort be international. Um, our international students do come from around the world. We've got students from Thailand, Nigeria, China, India, you know, we've got some Americans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's uh, one of the things that I think is really cool and compelling. I wish we could have more international students personally, but that's just me. Uh, so we've got, and of, of these 110 total, uh, 48 of them have finished. And that's not that the other, you know, 110 minus 48 have dropped out. It's more that they're still doing their PhDs. Um, and of the students that have graduated, all but one is employed, um, because I've been told that the one uh, recently quit his job and is moving on to different things. Um, so people are employable. Uh, and that's one of the things that I really appreciate um, and, and kind of my own personal buy-in to the CDP is that the students that we're training get snapped up like crazy. They're working around the world. A number of them have gone to the States, a number of them have gone to the EU, a number of them have stayed in the UK. You know, they're, they're going everywhere. And actually of these, most are working in quantum. I don't have exact numbers for you, um, but I went through the list the other day when I was preparing this talk and they really are, you know, the majority of them are working somehow in quantum, in quantum industry or quantum academia. Uh, and that's really cool. Uh, and actually students have been involved in founding two companies. One is quantum, one is not. Uh, and they hold leadership positions and many more. So this is one of our students. This is Dom Solway. Uh, Dom Solway comes from, uh, from what I can tell, kind of the middle of nowhere in Wales. The uh, summer before he started in the CDT, he was working in a factory. And now he's basically uh, designing and developing uh, integrated quantum photonic setups, both for education and for research. Uh, and so really, you know, I'm the one that I shouldn't be talking here. You should have Dom come and talk. Uh, but he and another CDT student basically founded this company and they're doing great. So what are the kind of the broader takeaways? You know, I've told you a bit about this program. I can tell you more. I've got more information than I could fit into a 10 minute talk. Um, but what, what do I want you to kind of take away from this? Uh, because I have basically sat here and advertised the CDT. Um, and the reason why I've kind of sat here and advertised it is because I believe it. Um, because I think that this really is kind of the way one of many ways, but a very good way to train PhD level uh, quantum in, uh, quantum folks. Um, and really, there's a lot of value in cohort based training. Uh, a lot of PhD programs, uh, especially in Europe and the UK, uh, you sort of you come in, you work with an advisor, they sort of slot you into their research group. And that's what you do for, you know, somewhere between three and five years, right? Um, and this really this cohort it gives them kind of a network to start with. Like they start with a network of sort of their immediate peers within their cohort, but then they've also got the, the previous and the you know subsequent cohorts. And so they, they get this network for free and it's really beautiful. Um, and you know, this is them as a cohort doing outreach. This is at the Swindon Science Festival. Uh, Swindon UK is a very, very lovely place. If you're my funding agency, if you're anybody else, uh, please avoid Swindon like the plague. Um, but uh, these students here in their green hoodies, I didn't choose the color, somebody else did, are actually teaching folks about quantum mechanics and they're having great time. Uh, we want to focus our, the emphasis on learning. Um, so not just learning the quantum, but learning sort of the professional skills that help bolster that. And the professional skills that we teach are professional skills that we know folks need because we talk to the stakeholders, we talk to them in industry and public policy, uh, the funding agencies, the academics, et cetera. So one of the hardest things is to teach a student that it doesn't matter, that their marks don't matter um, because they don't anymore at this stage. Uh, the emphasis is actually on learning the content. Uh, and it's not just quantum, like I said. So we have bespoke training in our, our responsible research and innovation. Um, I mean, a student literally came to us this morning and said, I want to organize an RRI event. Who should I have come speak? So if I reach out to some of you, either you're welcome or I'm sorry, depending on whether or not you'd like to visit Bristol. It's very nice. I like Bristol. Uh, but we teach communication, entrepreneurship, outreach, et cetera, et cetera. And like I said, our students are employable. They have jobs. That's really cool. Um, we are evolving. We've gone from a quantum engineering CDT to a quantum information science and technology CDT that's between the universities of Bristol and the University of Sussex. 
Um, and it looks something like this. This is a, uh, the logo has definitely changed, but the idea hasn't. We're trying to train the next generation of quantum engineers to be knowledgeable, incredible researchers, but also incredible citizens of the world. Um, and so if you want more information, that's the website. Uh, you can also reach out to me. Um, the website will evolve. Eventually we'll get the, the uh, QIST or QIST CDT website. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I've got. So thanks to my team uh, or I, a team I'm a part of, uh, Dr. Jorge Perretto is the director. Uh, there are a bunch of lecturers. We have our industry engagement manager and the folks that actually keep it running doing the admin. That's my pet lizard because I didn't know what else to put there. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Harry. Any questions from the audience? Leah. Thank you. Um, well, something I've always been curious about is that, well, we get quite a few results PhD results. 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 We get quite a few Bristol hey. Can you go to my please? Uh, no, oh, you need to. Me. Me. Can you say something? Okay. <laughs> we get quite a few PhD students from the Bristol CDT at Continuum, and something I was just always curious is some another PhD student working at Continuum was like, oh, how did like. Like, how does it work logistically to have a university partnering with industry to, because I think it's, is there a requirement that all the Bristol students have to do an internship or second I think No, it's not a, it's not a requirement. Um, but we, and actually to address this, like we found that it was very difficult to talk to industry and to address this, we hired uh, Rob here, um, who, who's actually also, uh, that's Rob, our industry engagement manager. Um, and we hired him quite literally to try to facilitate these connections. Um, and so it's, it's not a requirement that students do an industry internship. Increasing numbers of them want to, even the ones that want to go into academia because they want to see what, you know, what it's like in industry. Um, but it's also not a requirement that students have like an industry sponsored PhD. Uh, what I find actually, I used to question the value of an industry sponsored PhD. Um, because I was like, why don't you just like hire the student and actually pay them, you know, a living wage. And um, what I think I found from industry is actually that they use these industry sponsored PhDs as ways to sort of pursue sort of higher risk um, type activities that really do look a lot more like academic research. Um, but yeah, increasing numbers of our students do want to go on industry secondments and things like that. Uh, and they broadly have really positive experiences with that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Like it's difficult, but it's doable. Very good question. Okay, my is I didn't know I have to open the mic. No, 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 no. Just run the list. Yeah. Sonia is speaking. Nice to see you very much. And the question is very practical as always. Um, how many uh, time in proportion your students spend on non-quantum things? So the calendar was there. It's just that it was difficult to quantify. So maybe yeah. you have an estimate of that. And how many years your PhDs are doing the PhD? Because yeah. So here I can go back. Um, basically, the, the the PhD, the research part, is three years, um, which is, in my opinion, way too short. But that's just me. Uh, that's the American bias. I had a six-year PhD. But uh, in this first year, basically, I would say, like, practically, it's something like maybe 80, 20 or 75, 25 quantum, non-quantum. Um, in the second through fourth year, I would say, actually, the, per, the it might be something more like 90, 10, because they still do have to do the research. They have to get a PhD. Like, at the end of the day, they have to write a thesis. And that's, like, what determines, you know, they do a viva, and that's what determines if they're a doctor or not at the end of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd say it's probably 75, 25. Okay, Give or take. And we'll do one last quick, quick question and quick answer if possible. <laughs> oh, first of all, Carrie, like, fantastic initiative. It's like mm -hmm. a policy makers bring for ecosystem creation, I would say. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask a question, like, how, uh, with the entrepreneurship training, how many, uh, people have 
actually started a startup and also like with the training how uh in your experience what the student have talked about like how is that helped them help them in their careers and so on? um okay so i think of we oh. only have three students that have either founded or co-founded a company um from this uh the entrepreneurship training is typically is provided we actually have a really nice ecosystem within bristol for entrepreneurship for stem in general but then also sort of more like quantum focused entrepreneurship a lot of it is sort of getting academics to think more in terms of their own intellectual property and how to you know talk to venture capitalists and not other academics um and then in terms of their experience uh i mean we the students that i've talked to and the alumni that i've talked to do think really highly of the cdt and many much of this isn't me tooting my own horn because i've only really been here for the last two years um but they come back and they're like oh yeah you know it wasn't it's not usually like this was also in china and rainbows and it was amazing but like i learned a lot and i'm now employed and i now like e they even know you know if they don't like what they're doing they're very it's very easy for them to shift um so i think that i you know i, I don't know how much more precise i can be at this moment standing in front of you but uh they are like it's very very positive um at, let's just say everybody was pleased when we got renewed for five more years <laughs> Again, uh, for her great talks and answers. Thank you. I'll see you guys next year in person. Uh, and uh, finally, in this session, we have Peter Hermas, who's going to be talking on Don't Think Quantum, Think Quantum Technological Functions. Uh, so Peter is a philosopher of quantum technology and design at Delft and leads ethics research for Quantum Delta NL, as well as heading the Quantum Lab at the Faculty of Technology, Policy and Management. And he works on the societal and moral impact of quantum technologies. Okay, um, very nice to speak. Uh, indeed, I, I'm a um, quantum physicist by training and I'm doing on the ethics of quantum. But the thing, what I want to argue for is uh, forget the quantum. And so the topic we are working on is really important. Uh, the ethics, the policy, the governments, but don't think so much in terms of quantum. It's just a label. It's not something specific uh, where which sets it apart from, let's say, other emerging technologies. Um, more specifically, um, I want to argue that if you want to speak with stakeholders, and I'm not students, stakeholders, uh, it was part of uh, Fabien's uh, paper a little bit when, when you reached out to citizens, to others. If you want to speak with those, don't explain uh, quantum mechanics uh, in order to facilitate um, uh, the exchange. Um, think in terms of uh, functions. So don't even bring in the artists, sorry about that. Uh, there's another language available to make uh, that uh, conversation productive. Okay, um, how do I arrive at this? Well, uh, mainly my own experience, uh, what, what I experienced with um, speaking with stakeholders uh, my background in philosophy of technology, so I, I'm reusing slides from about 20 years ago. Really fun. Uh, did also some metaphysical and technical uh, artifacts. We'll bring that in too. The literature, um, that's the weak spot. So please give me feedback uh, on, uh, on that side. Um, so it's mainly based on um, an argument based on my experience. Um, Okay, the deep proposition, I heard it here also, uh, I think also in the first uh, Natasha's uh, uh, paper. Okay, yeah, we, we should um, explain quantum technologies to the outside world in order to enable them. And as part of that, we should uh, bring understanding also of uh, the quantum mechanical phenomena. Um, and it's exactly that second part which, um, Although I 
I worked on it myself. Uh, so these are the magazines uh, we talked about. And so I had to explain it to, uh, uh, in this case, citizens, uh, quantum uh, mechanics, quantum computing, internet, uh, and to argue, okay, let's not do it. Uh, let's not necessarily do it. We can do it, it's fun, but um, uh, it distracts. Um, my experience was that whenever you speak uh, with a bunch of uh, ex experts in their fields, I spoke with people from police, from uh, tax agencies, as soon as you bring in a physicist to explain quantum uh, technologies, you lost half an hour um, because they all of a sudden just in introduce this enormous gap um, between experts, laypersons, and it takes lots of time to bring them back into their roles of experts. And when they are back in that uh, role, um, they're perfectly able to discuss quantum technology. Um, so that's what I want to explore. Um, and um, yeah, argue. Give an example. Um, I had uh, a little project on testing a tool, a uh, design uh, game um, on uh, identifying the risks in ports of a quantum technology. Um, and, and 11 people in a port uh, in Holland said, yes, we're going to do that two hours of our times, uh, but you have to explain us as a, as a kind of gift, uh, quantum mechanics. Okay, sure, <laughs> nice, fun. Uh, that's my background, so do. Uh, but that worked out not well. Um, what's, and it was not quantum, actually. Uh, this was the experiment. Let's say you have a, a harbor port, chips. Uh, let's assume that you build a sensor uh, system in it, um, which can uh, detect whether you have uh, scuba divers what's in under these uh, ships, if they're all submarines. Um, these are the sensors. You connect them, of course, with quantum internet. That's the quantum computer. Um, and in real time, you can see what happens in your canals. Question was, okay, um, what will happen uh, if you install this? What are the risks of this? Um, of course, I had to explain uh, quantum uh, computing. I said, well, okay, it's, it's just calculating with factors. Uh, just assume the yeah, factor, um, that's a, it's a spin, uh, don't worry what it is, it's a factor. Uh, and we, and you know, of course, normal computers, uh, then you calculate with zeros, one, um, and so on. And the calculation is uh, that you have some transformation from here to another number, uh, you can interpret that, that's calculation. We'll do that too with quantum uh, computing. Uh, so this is more or less in terms of a metaphor what quantum computing was. Well, I lost them, all 11 experts. Not here, here. Quantum, okay, normal computing is translating, uh, transforming uh, zeros and ones. And there were experts, the people who look day after day at screens to see what happens in the port, who are really skilled in the, let's say, the social dimension of these systems, they said, okay, whatever, let's sit this out. Um, so my experience was, um, okay, if you try to uh, explain quantum uh, mechanics uh, to enable uh, um, stakeholders to uh, talk with you to think themselves, um, you're not realizing that. Um, you actually emphasize again that distinction. Um, and you're not taking these people uh, as experts. Uh, so uh, my, I don't do it also anymore. I just go in and tell, uh, I showed a picture of uh, sport and they gave a wonderful uh, uh, analysis of what went wrong bribes and, and making the sensors a little bit of cue. That was what happened. They don't need a uh, position for that. Um, where does it come from? Well, this is, now the sites are coming up uh, 20 years ago. 
this is this is 20 years. Um, 20 years ago, when I did philosophy of uh, physics, um, whenever you did po uh, popularization, um, you knew that you had two audiences simultaneously. People who are interested in quantum mechanics, um, but also people who wanted to attach all kinds of funny, uh, let's say, non-physics uh, meanings to it. Uh, and if, as soon as you said, okay, the Schrodinger cat is dead and alive, great, no, no one understands, okay, that's wonderful. I already thought that that would be the case. Um, Einstein was already once at that, and everyone immediately says, okay, that's a person who uh, laughs at us, st uh, stick out his tongue, because he knows something which we don't. Uh, we also think he's kind of a man, fluffy hair. So yeah, that's great. This one, uh, and then yeah, you have these books uh, from Tao Physics, uh, which makes these links to uh, physics and uh, Oriental uh, religion. A normal physicist uh, would use that ambiguity uh, also. It was fun. Uh, so one of my first talks was this. Uh, what's the, what is quantum mechanics? Well, you know uh, classical mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics is not like that. Uh, you don't know if you shoot the particle to the screen, how it evolves uh, to um, space. You only know that it will hit screen at some point with certain probability. What happens in between? I didn't say, but uh, in order to, again, use humor as kind of distraction. Uh, I wanted to explain. Well, look, you all know this uh, assassination of John F. Kennedy. We still don't know whether it was one person or multiple person mm -hmm. shooting Kennedy. Uh, if you assume it's one, then you have to solve this riddle that a bullet came like this, and then mercy went like that, not possible. Here's the solution. Quantum mechanics gives you this. <laughs> that trajectory is with a certain probability possible. Everyone happy there? Yes, I, I knew it already. Quantum mechanics would be nuts. Um, I didn't explain everyone happy. Uh, because it feeds inspiration for mysterious, which, which is fine. It's, it's also, I don't want to mock it. It's uh, inspiration for new. Uh, innovations, um, lots of things came out of it. Um, but that is what uh, explaining me uh, quantum mechanics can incite. Good, what's the alternative? Alternative is a piece of other uh, philosophy, philosophy of technology uh, I was engaged in, to delve it's, it's something completely different, the dual nature of technical artifacts. The idea was that uh, if you um, describe something natural, say stone or, or, or that uh, lizard, which is just so you do the physics uh, and that's it. Maybe for the lizard, you assume it's sentient, you also add that description. For technical artifacts, you have more. You say it has a physics, uh, you describe it a physical way, but you also assign uh, meanings to it, you can realize goals and Technical functions are the uh, solutions, are the ways to express it. So what you have is, if you have a description of technical artifact, you tell what its structure is, um, so you can describe that um, camera, you can tell what kind of functions it is, uh, and then you can start, start talking about its uses. Um, and all these levels have their different languages, so the hardware software, chemistry, math, physics, um, uh, functions to talk about what something can do, its, its disposition, behavior, and then on the level of uses, uh, you talk about actions, uh, goals you can realize, impact it can have. Uh, why is this interesting? Well, what you can see, uh, you saw that also in some of the talks uh, about engineering, uh, Quantum engineers, well, it's about this. Uh, so the spins of uh, 
from Oxford. It's it's like this. How can you bridge this gap? Uh, as a function, how do you relate that to the technology? These engineers, and that was the previous talk, don't care so much about that. They black box that part. Um, what do designers, PR people, well, they don't care so much about physics. Uh, they say, well, I just got here a, a thing which can do this and this. Uh, let's talk how uh, I can uh, use it. Um, what kind of visions can I develop? Um, uh, what is needed for that use and so on. Well, making quickly the link to quantum, um, if you talk about quantum artifacts, this would look like uh, the, the full description you see quantum things there. Um, well, from that perspective, um, yes, if you talk with the engineers, if you want to teach them, please go quantum uh, mechanics. They need it. They need it to, to build things which have functions. But as, as soon as you talk with um, stakeholders, uh, or you talk about the impact of uh, quantum technologies, you don't need that uh, quantum mechanics part. Uh, you can just talk about this is the functions we should have. It can uh, relay uh, information, mention qubits, get information in a secure manner. Um, what can you do with it? Um, and as soon as you give that to the floor, the experts will immediately say, okay, I can do this, 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 and there, there it goes wrong, like in that court. Um, so, conclusion. Um, Explain quantum mechanics to students, come to you, come to help uh, populate the workforce. Um, for stakeholders, just forget about quantum mechanics. Talk about the functions which uh, things have. Because it doesn't enable stakeholders to explain um, quantum mechanics. Of course, it's a kind of paternalistic uh, position. I'm, I'm not going to explain it to you. You don't need it. Of course, that's not meant uh, in this uh, argument. So, so please make it available. Make explanations of quantum mechanics behind the technology available. But don't start with it. Don't take it as a necessary step when you reach out to uh, stakeholders. That was my argument. Thank you very much, Peter. Any questions from the audience? Okay, let's yeah. um, Yes, when you mentioned uh, when you mentioned this project uh, from the port, uh, uh, did you also mention the timeline? Uh, because I'm thinking, of course, it's important to consider the uses, but but because it's a future technologies, it's always hypothetical uses. So, do you explain in a certain timeline when this would be? available, if it's the long term, short term, or you no. just say, no. So tomorrow we will have a quantum computer at the board with the quantum systems and patients. No, so, so what, what we, we just came in, we, we talked a bit about the tools, how to, um, how to get information about risks from them. So that's a certain game workshop uh, built around the game. They were interested in that. Um, Tried to explain a bit of a quantum technology was non-interesting uh, part, um, and then just a picture on the uh, on the screen and go for it. Of course, the tools ask about okay, uh, if you have something like that, what would an, uh, a thief do, uh, or what would the police do? Um, as soon as you uh, pose those questions, they immediately. Uh, Go on. It's it's rather the experts like we who say, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's what's the timeline? Eh? So it's a, will that happen? Um, and, and then then let's say the flow of augmentation stops. But uh, my experience is that with experts as well as students um, in the design sciences, you just can give them the description of the function, and they start exploring. Um, no need for additional information. Okay. Thank you.
Oh, many, many questions. I'm going to go with the uh, real quick one. Thank you very much for the presentation. And you um, you ask about the science communication literature. And I was wondering if you ever use um, someone, I'll say someone, to act as a translator or as a broker during those meetings with, uh, with stakeholders. Because with engineering, it's easier because they all have the same languages. But um, have you ever tried to use someone, and I mean, to do the translation between science and social, so, uh, social impacts or stuff like that? Do you ever have someone or you were always the, the, the translator to them? No, so, 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 so the, the final format which I use for um, talking with experts is uh, to just tell who am I uh, and, and what purposes. Um, I have a physicist in the room, uh, but after two, three minutes, say, okay, we're, we're going to put this person in the corner. We can consult him, uh, it's typically him, if needed. Um, but but that physicist is not um, uh, calling the shots, so to say. No. And then, no, I'm not no. at all. I, I don't say anything. Uh, so I leave it up to uh, the group. And assume that you have someone from tax agency, someone from foreign affairs, someone uh, from um, um, social service in the room. Um, first, they uh, are looking at each other for two minutes. What will I say? Will uh, she report it to the minister? Uh, if that's gone, they will just talk. And they will tell me, and they will tell each other what the impact is. So, um, in a sense, the mediator is, is just uh, opening the space for talking. Now, the literature says that uh, if you explain quantum mechanics, um, then people get more engaged. Um, and in a sense, I'm telling the opposite. So, yeah. so in that sense, so I'm, I'm on the uh, yeah, weak friends. We can have one very quick question. If it's quick, does anybody have a quick question? Please? Right now, we are approaching to the end of the following session. <laughs> we make three. Any very burning quick question for Will Rash? This is not a question. I just want to, 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 to say, please don't be uh, um, afraid of uh, the I artists who try to explain quantum mechanics. I'm here just to send my up. That's <laughs> 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 why he's here. You <laughs> said why not here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's move to the next session. Yeah, okay. For those of you who thought, okay, thanks God she's away, here I am again. <laughs> I'm very sorry for this. So we will now discuss, or better to say, these three amazing ladies over here will discuss now if we are, who are we educating? Are we just educating? future workers, or are there maybe more people we need to think of? So I'm very happy that I have the honor to basically moderate this discussion here. We also have room for some questions. So if you want to ask a question or comment, just feel free. And I will try to, to move with that wherever it has to be moved, OK? Um, that will be funny. <laughs> I'm incredibly clumsy. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm super happy to be here. So we have all my very right side here, we have Monica. Monica is very experienced. So first, I'm really, really impressed by that she really studied wine business management. And uh, I, I really um, I want, I want to ask her questions about this later. But she also worked in very different startups. Um, she's been working in, in HR. So she is really talking about workforce from an experience level and knowing what she's talking about. So you that you are here with us and discussing this with us. Thanks. Okay, so then we have Oksana, so you already met her today as well. Um, 
I'm very happy that she's here. So she is a communicator. She's working with schools. We know she's very successful in keeping the people here, even if they already want to leave. Um, so there's still a thing. So I think we also have here um, a lot of experience for this topic. And last but not least, I want to introduce here Akas, right pronounced, right? Aka. <laughs> so she also is very experienced. So she is a wedding. She knows what other companies are searching for. She is very experienced in setting up collaborations. So welcome. Sorry. Very good. <laughs> um, no, so far nothing is writing. It's just a little bit distracting. So thank you very much. So to start our discussion about like who are we educating, who are we just educating future workers? I would like to have like a starting statement to who are we educating, who do we need to educate, and the challenges from each of you. So Oksana and Abel, do you want to start? Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much for this. Uh... Very entertaining and interesting of us. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can go today. <laughs> but entertaining at least. So um from my point of view, as, as I dedicated to education like entire life as a researcher, because I was teaching to students when I was a master student, to students when I was a PhD student, to students when I was a postdoc, and so on and so far. So I was like teaching constantly all the time. But I learned about teaching when I worked with Francisca and Braunschweig, because then I was in the department of the of the physics education, where actually one thinks deeply on what are the challenges of learning and then consequently also of teaching. And uh, so I understood that, uh, but, but First of all, we are training people. We are not training the those who will do things for us. We are training the future generation that will live on this planet. And uh, whether we teach quantum to them or not quantum to them, it doesn't really matter. They they need to become they need to become uh, how do you say reassured by themselves and confident in what they are doing. So the topic is a good thing, but then we should first see the person in front of us, and second thing what matter you will be or she or they will be uh, interested. And the other thing which I learned is actually by teaching you are mainly learning. So it was not enough for me to learn by doing research, no. So I decided I didn't want to learn more. So I go to learn how to teach, and uh, you are learning actually about think when you are teaching it. This is the real moment when you learn about something is when you are teaching it, because then suddenly you need to understand it so well. And then when you are teaching, you have other challenges like uh, who is paying for you when you teach? Will they pay for you continuously? I'm paid by a yearly basis. So, and after that, will there be still teaching for those people? And uh, will they be somehow afterwards for this? So I would say that the environment in which we're teaching is very dynamic because quantum technology is very dynamic. Funding landscape is changing. Like in five years, there has been millions of euros that suddenly bombarded education and nobody knows how to take them. So this is also a big challenge. And then, so there is this kind of uh, challenges that I see. One is like helping a person to get uh, through into life. And be proud uh, of himself or of themselves. And uh, the other one is to adapt to the fast developing environment of teaching. Uh, and this is our challenge as, as, as teachers as well. Yes, I find this two things really. Mike, do you want to go on? Yeah, I totally agree with Oksana that uh, we need to see the people behind the workers and not only think of what we can teach them to bring them where we want to have them. It's about thinking out of the box, giving them confidence, giving them freedom to learn, to find a path, all these things, and not to, to make a, like a production line. And then we have 500 uh, people that are the same. That's, that's not helping us. So, um, speaking from the side of the HR of, of a company, what we need is we need different skills and we need people to work in uh, in different teams, in diversity teams, in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams, like, like you said in your um, 
presentation, Fabian, that they can talk to each other like physicists and chemists. They have different terms, different languages, but they need to work together and they need to speak together. So they need to find a common language. So, um, yeah. So for me, it's important to see the people behind, to see their the personality, to push them a bit, to motivate them and to just let them be themselves so they can work best when they're not under pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your, what's your take on this? Would you, would you necessarily agree? No. So? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Thank you for your perspectives. I think they are very valuable. However, I am a very good example of um, well, non-traditional education system. And I think personally for me, the traditional educational system failed miserably. Uh, so I think that there are a few points that I would like to make. Uh, one is that I really liked what uh, Wenzel said, combined with your talk, Fabian, and also with Peter. I think that purposeful learning uh, that is sparked by curiosity and that is also being presented in a way that people can connect to, regardless of being experts in quantum physics or physicists in any way, this will bring a lot more people into the workforce in the quantum industry. Because I personally have a lot of work experience in various industries, from design, um, I'm also an artist. I also know how to code and build websites. I have a degree in international relations. I went to math physics high school. I've done a lot of things from everything. And I joined the quantum industry a year ago, uh, basically, uh, as a person that's doing marketing. I'm the chief marketing officer for our venture investment fund and startup accelerator. So it's not a necessarily traditional path, right, of getting into the quantum industry. But it didn't stop me to learn everything I could and to understand quantum physics and understand the potential of quantum technologies in general. And this really makes me super creative and motivated to promote it even more and attract more people into this world. So I don't necessarily think that we should only focus on the children and, you know, like we kind of use the same traditional educational methods and, and see, you know, like, okay, who am I talking to? How is I think it's also important to, to tailor your message, right? Uh, but it's more about how do we approach this industry in an ethical and responsible way, which is why I think it's important that we're all here, uh, that a lot more people want to join us. And to join us, in, where together we can create a very different world, the one that is now being portrayed in mass media, right? And I think that quantum technologies with the potential for change especially if they have ethics and responsibilities embedded in it, uh, that will attract a lot of people that will want to work in this industry, regardless if they're physicists or not. Of course, soft skills are important for every industry. Like nobody knew how to build websites 20 years ago to technologies or SaaS, you know, and still there's a lot of people working in, in tech startups. Okay, so now we have like, Two sides of this panel, so Art, you, you guys, each other. But but why are we against? I don't think so. It's much fun. Much fun. Oh, okay. to to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we, we we've seen very different perspectives. So um, Monica, how would you say okay how to bridge like these two very valid points we 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 saw here on on both argumentations? How would you say okay how could we basically bridge on one hand the challenges specifically in this quantum related field, which is developing super fast, where we have a lot of different skills we need also just on the, on the hard skill set together with the soft skill set. So where do you see the challenges and how would you try to navigate these and to bridge these? Oh yeah, that's a hard question. I, I see there's there's challenges. Um, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm watching. Yeah, I, I prepared something, so don't worry. Wow. <laughs> now, um, so yeah, 
that's that's we we all together need to do this. We as a society. So we have people learning math as a good foundation, logical thinking, programming skills, um, good knowledge in quantum mechanics. And then they go out when they have learned the basics. They can do um they can study abroad, they can do some internships. We always have internships at HQS quantum simulations and we're happy to welcome people. So then they learn and yeah, I think it's it's you never stop learning. So you start with your career at university and then you go out and you you learn from other colleagues. You you need to be open, you need to be uh, uh, willing to to talk to other people, to work in diverse teams, and then then you learn. I think it's not it's not a fixed path. It's there. It's just like you start somehow, and then like uh, in Peter's, it was Peter, no, where he mentioned this shot. And if it's coming on the other side. You don't know where it's, where it's going. <laughs> but it will be on the other side. They are close already. Yeah. So we saw that he's so close. <laughs> you get what I want to say? Yeah. I, I think so. Um, I just think how do you, in in the beginning, so if, if for example, we have people where like the, the way of education systems is not working. Mm -hmm. And we need to do it ourselves. I have an answer. Yeah, you, you can help. You can help. <laughs> or at least a tentative one. So the as there have been a couple of projects recently from the European Union, and the, there are a lot of like communities that have got this uh, funds. And one is dedicated to master level, so to educating people at master level. They are still focused a lot on quantum tech. Nevertheless, they have all those integrated uh, software skills and ethics and stuff, but for people at the university. The other thing, the, the other project is, 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 is watching instead on the workers. So it's the QT, uh, QT Indu project. They are looking at, at, at workers and they try to tap whatever may be missing, so they first made the questionnaires, and so they, they, they cannot try to top things where people can just go and learn online something they are missing. And now there's coming a new wave, so we hope it will work, but there is, we just we just formed the consortia, we submitted the project, but we don't know if it works. But our idea was that practically, we try to, to target people, young people at this moment, at least uh, we, we, we connect to the bachelor level, bachelor master, but we say, okay, let's try to teach quantum or whatever quantum use or quantum usefulness uh, functionality, like I like what Peter said, is functionality to the people who don't study physics and will never do this technology, but will eventually use them or help develop. So medicine, biology, chemistry, and all other disciplines, ethics, law, and, and so what, what, all the rest of the world, practically, we teach something about this new technology. And then the, the, the rest of the world disciplines, we teach to physicists who are going to do this technology. So they are aware in which world they are going to build this technology. So a little bit of cross fertilization and uh, we got 50 partners interested in doing that. And uh, practically the, 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 the hardest, the, the, the core where I think everything will nuclear around will be the, the, the events that we will host kind of a work, not work group, it's called them students network. And every year there will be a student network and the student network will, apart from the fact of taking courses here and there, it's okay, but they will be coming together, they will be doing project works together, and they will be going around in industries, and we will have a whole pool of industries available for that in different cities and in different places, where they will be trying to explore, do internship here, internship there, and by the end of the year, we'll like say, okay, but that's more for me, or mm, this thing is interesting, or maybe this year try another one, so we want to make this playground, as mm -hmm. I think that this was more uh, along the line that Monica was saying, so it's kind of playground where people can pick and pick and, 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 and choose exactly and go the way they, they want. Because this is this we, as we saw the way to to make this interdisciplinarity necessity 
satisfied and also the bridge between industry and, and the university. So fingers crossed <laughs> that we get the project. Do you think that will bring the spark you were talking about, like the spark we need basically for the people to engage more programs like this? Or do you think this is something which should have should start earlier in their careers, in the people's career stage or later? Or what do you think? Well, I could challenge the concept of a career, right? <laughs> <laughs> but let's not go there. <laughs> I think let's one, get a drink. Another way. <laughs> and I drink. <laughs> I, um, another way, I think that there, these are very good points. Uh, mm -hmm. But another way that we can do it is actually create successful businesses in quantum. Uh, and with successful businesses, you will need to hire people from various industries in order to grow. Right. So the startups and the companies that are now in existence, and we start to have quite a few successful ones, like Quantela, Pascal, and IOQ, and D-Wave, there's, there's quite a few, and they keep coming, uh, which is great for us as an accelerator and VC fund. Um, but with these companies growing, they will need to hire more people, and then it will be an organic growth of the, of the workforce, and supporting these companies all the way from their inception, I think it's also important. But of course, before that, it's good. It's also important to have the academia in the background, creating the quantum physicists that can build these businesses. So it's a an ecosystem work. For the for the things you all were all mentioning, do you think that our current systems, that our current programs, basically produced people you think which are needed for the future? Because we're talking a lot about like bachelors, and masters. People we have at the moment in the European Union around 50 master programs, which are focusing on quantum technologies specifically. So do you think that for a, like, because we were talking a lot about like how the people should be educated, et cetera, that these programs first, that they basically lead to, to educating the people the way they should be educated? Or do you think um, the, the problems also a little bit more systematically and inherently in these programs? Right. Uh, yeah, I want to. <laughs> These programs are definitely needed. Um, and, you know, in order to become a quantum physicist, in order to build quantum technologies, you need to learn the science, right? So this, this category of, of the workforce has to exist regardless. So how to grow the workforce, how to build them, how to bring more people in, that's a very different topic. But the academy and the programs that exist now and the focus on, on masters and PhDs, I think will always be very important for this specific category of scientists. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's important to have a basic knowledge, to have to have a good understanding of math and physics and chemistry and all the natural science things we need. And of course, of programming and computer science. And with that, you, you can start and learn more. But this more, we need to see where to find that, perhaps in special programs or at companies where you get trained in the job, yeah. That's and also to have the programs where you teach or at least spark the interest of um, scientists to build businesses as well. To have to integrate entrepreneurship into academia, I think it's also very important. We have a problem. There no. is sun outside yes. and we need to go and have a fresh air. Now, the problem is the following. So with all these nice things that we are trying to do, master programs, PhD programs, all of that stuff. So Hureka, which is a nice company and does a lot of analysis and everything, they did estimate how much workforce is needed. So, mm -hmm. and we don't have enough. And we will not have it soon. And this is a problem of the human capital because uh, people are already trained in the university since many, many years, no? And now suddenly we want them to choose quantum physics. <laughs> what? There is a lot of architecture and literature and so and language. There are so many disciplines. Why the hell they need to choose quantum physics and specifically quantum technology and not do civil engineer and build bridges? 
cool. Yeah, it's cool. Okay, so here is the problem. So we need to figure out, first of all, for ourselves, are we satisfied with the fact that we draw the other disciplines and populate this one? Is it going to create a be beautiful future for us? Because there will be less bridges and there will be more quantum compute. I'm, I'm exaggerating, okay? But this is the reality. Because when you put a new master program in the university, in most cases, they will ask, why? And where will you get students? No? And so, the, 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 in reality, where do they come from? You will all explain it. They come from physics, they come from, from, from computer science, some from biology, some from economics. So they, they realize that they want to get excited by the quantum because it's cool. Totally agree with you, quantum is cool. I'm not saying it's not. But we have to be aware that we are not producing, I would say, at the moment we are stealing from other things. So from my point of view, what we have to do, we have to add to all what exists, we have to add because there is an opportunity to add. And we have to motivate more people study STEM. So this is how it starts before the university, okay? <laughs> from school, we need to just convince like more people to do, let's say more, uh, more studies maybe and so on and so far, because nowadays we also have like, it's a trauma in Europe with the human capital. I don't know if you realized we are in the decrease of, of uh, fertility or uh, fertility, the, the, the birth rate birth. over the birth. So, uh, and the only reason it works, all our industry is because we have immigrants. This is the only reason it works. And it works less and less because the politics are strict and they're stricter for the immigration in Europe. And it will be worse tomorrow than it is today. So this, I promise you, this, this is, uh, I'm not, I'm not. And, but so we need to find a way how to, how to unplug this bottleneck, because if there will be no more people coming into the steam or into this kind of business, in addition to what is already there, because there are a lot of useful things people are starting. We are not saying that this is not useful anymore because there is quantum tech. No. So, uh, my deep question is, what do we do? Okay, once people say we have to involve more girls and this always works, I agree. So then you will double practically, this is already not that. Other people say that you, you should involve more, more diversity, ethnicity and all that. And this is also true, but we have to work with politicians that allow us to, do, to accept people from outside. So these are problems which are not related and how would we teach, what do we teach, when do we teach, this is who do we teach, right, right? So Anka has an answer. <laughs> Let's listen to that. <laughs> I like focusing on solutions. So I agree that right now there's not enough workforce even for the computer science industry, mm -hmm. right? There's a lack of programmers and all that. Um, however, there is also the challenge of autom automatization. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of people that are doing now routine work uh, will not have a job in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a huge potential there to actually reskill the workers that are now, for example, I live in Basel in Switzerland and I, you know, Rush, Novartis, all the big pharma companies are there. And I have friends that work there and they said that, you know, moving from Novartis to Rush, for example, the, the difference in technologies that they have is really huge. So a lot of things that are done manually in one company are being replaced by machines in the other. And these are people that have studied biology, chemistry, they're like highly skilled and they know what they're doing and they will be replaced by machines very soon. Mm -hmm. So I think that the challenge there and the opportunity is how to reskill these people to work in the quantum industry, for mm -hmm. example, or computer science or whatever, just find a way to, to move them right and this is why i wanted earlier to challenge the concept of a career because i don't think there's a career trajectory anymore we all have to be adaptable and flexible and think about what does the society need for us to do and what is the next thing that we should learn as people so that we can be relevant in the future even 20 years from now we're not going to stop working at 65 probably